Yes, Mayor Bagley. Mayor Bagley, obviously you are in attendance. Council I Member indeed am attendance. <laughs> Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Doggo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right. Um, Marsha, would you like to lead us in the pledge this evening? No, but I will. <laughs> I hate doing it, which is why I call it different people. I know. <laughs> it's my turn. I'll do it Here next we week. Go. I pledge allegiance to the to flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. And I'm going to call Harold, Tim, Don, and I think Joan wasn't on mute, but the re and Susie, I think she was on. We go on mute, Susie. Yeah, I'm going to call them all out of order for being on mute and making me, Marsha, and Joan say the pledge alone. Y'all suck. All right. I did it last week. Well, you're going to do it next week now, too, Harold. I'll do it again. I'll do it to everybody who was on mute this week from now. That's the order right there next time. No, just kidding. All right. Anyone wishing to provide public comment? Just a quick reminder. You have to be watching the live stream. Then uh, once the call-in information is displayed, uh, you'll enter the meeting ID, and then you'll be asked uh, for your participant ID, and then press pound. Uh, when you hear confirmation, you've entered the meeting, um, you'll hear how many people are in the meeting, and then you're going to wait, and you'll be called in order of when you got in, and the number that you're going to be as associated with is the last three digits of your phone number. Um, like always, your comments are limited to three minutes. And at the end of three minutes, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut you off, no matter how awesome um, your comments are. So that's where we're at. Can we have an emo uh, Can we have an motion to approve the minutes of August 25th, 2020? Councilmember Peck. So moved. Second. All, all right. It's been moved and seconded. Um, assuming there's no further debate, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right. Uh, 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 the motion passes unanimously. Um, any agenda revisions, submission of documents, or motions direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas? Councilmember Peck? Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Actually, it's a question, and if it's, uh, there may not be a motion. So um, at a previous meeting, Harold, we uh, directed staff to put on a future agenda the amended air quality contract. And I'm wondering if that has been assigned to an agenda yet, a date? Um, I am not working on that. Eugene, I don't know, is Dale on tonight? Harold, Eugene here. Uh, I know we are working on the amendment and we're looking at either uh, the second meeting in September or first meeting in October, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to check on that. I don't need a motion then. All right, great. And then Harold, the only question I have, we're still ready on September 15th with the LHA presentation, correct? Correct. They're right. gonna, we're gonna put that under special reports and presentations. Perfect. All right. Then seeing nobody else's hand, let's move on to your COVID-19 update. Do you have anything? Um, yes, Mayor, Council, I do. Um, Can you all see my screen with the graph on it? Yes. Yes, okay. So this is a Boulder County site and I actually wanted to um, go over this. Uh, as you can see, this is the number of Boulder County residents newly reporting as tested positive um, as of September 8th. And part of the reason why I wanted to show you this is that we have two fairly significant, well, not fairly, significant spikes related to the number of cases in Boulder County, um, just under 70, um, and it looks like it was on the 5th, and then almost 50 on this date. Um, I did have the chance to talk to um, Jeff Zayak today about those numbers, and, you know, was that something that they were seeing in the communities, or, or was it re related to the university um, system? And, and based on what he told me that I could say today, and there's going to be more information coming out, but... Um, 
roughly, approximately 70% of the cases that we're seeing coming in at this level are associated with CU. Um, and the majority of cases they're seeing are also coming in in the, in the lower are also associated with uh, the university system. And so for me, that was important to understand, is this something that we're just seeing in all the communities? Is it an isolated community? And so I want you all, to, I wanted you all to know that these spikes, that's what he indicated um, it's related to. As we move down through the charts and looking at the data, you may remember that when we looked at uh, the five-day average on PCR testing, I believe the last time I went over this, we were at about 1.7. It's now moved back up to 2.5, obviously based on those spikes. Um, and then this is where you can see the rolling five-day average on that PCR testing. Um, you know, still at 2.5, it's, um, it's a relatively good number, but obviously not as good as where we were trending uh, a week or so ago. This chart again shows you the number of tests that they were performing. So again, you see the ability to hit at 500. Um, and, and so when you look at transmission source, you can see that of those recent cases, and this is 830 to 95 community and limited person to person, which is obviously connected to the gatherings um, that um, we all have seen on the media. This is um, an interesting chart. I mean, so again, um, what you're seeing is that growth in the 20 to 29 year old category um, continues to distance itself from, from the other age categories, but you are seeing 10 to 19 pick up a little bit, but the rest are tending to stay pretty consistent in the overall flow of what we've seen, at least within the last month of COVID-19. Um, again, this is the five day average trend. You see that spike once again, and then you see it, it dip down. Um, and here's where you actually see where this is occurring. So if you remember, we had recently been fairly close to Boulder in terms of the number of cases, and then they were just under 100 ahead of us. Um, now they're almost 200 cases ahead of us, which really is just ratifying that information that Jeff, uh, that, that I had the opportunity to talk to Jeff about today. So Boulder's at 1,009, we're at 805. So if you look at where we were, I mean, again, once again, and you look at where the other communities were, um, it's really showing that the growth is, is really occurring um, that's associated with the university system. And then you're also starting to see it here. Remember, we at one point a couple of weeks ago, we were at 36.7. Um, it's starting to drop to, again, you're seeing that connected to Boulder. The good news that we're starting to see um, is if you look at this, um, all of them tend to be in green. Uh, the ICU beds is still in yellow. Um, and remember the available med surge beds, and again, this is related to um, elective procedures and that have been going on and, and things beyond COVID. And we had been a little further in the red. We're right on the line. Earlier today, before the change in numbers, it was actually in the, in the yellow. And so the hospital system is, is still doing um, relatively well are still doing well based on the information that we have. So um, in the conversation, um, you all can probably expect an update from Jeff coming either late tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, it's probably gonna echo many of the things that I've talked to you about, but they are watching the university system pretty close. Um, one of the things that they're doing is, um, I saw Robert on here for another item, uh, you know, they're doing some of the biobot testing and determining um, what residence halls and that they can test. And so that's also, um, you know, adding to the, to the number of cases that we're seeing. Um, we are seeing um, enforcement in, in Boulder in terms of the activities. You all may have seen that um, recently on the news. Uh, so they are watching the numbers. The, the question that I have to, to get with him about or get with the county health staff is really what does that mean in terms of where we stand in terms of moving to protect our neighbor and how do we move in that direction since they are pretty sure that it is related to that campus setting. And so I have more questions. Um, we just didn't have a lot of time to talk. And as we get that information, we'll be providing that to, count, to, to the council. But I did want you to see these numbers uh, because it is something new based on what we've been seeing. Um, I, I will tell you from my conversations, I think that, that Jeff and the County Health Department do understand it and, and they're working with um, our colleagues in Boulder and then also the university system. Be happy to answer any questions at this point. I see two questions. 
Sorry, Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Harold, uh, as we look at the, the data and the spikes that are associated with the university, uh, a, a couple of meetings ago, we looked at the criteria or standards for whatever the next is. The next phase, care for your neighbor. What's the, what's the term? Protect our mean? neighbor. Protect, Protect your, neighbor. your neighbor. Yeah. Um, there were, I think, were set, are there seven criteria that have to be met? I think um, eight or nine. Uh, though, is it fair to assume that those spikes that we see, uh, that we attribute to the university, because it's in Boulder County, um, would would be a factor in keeping or prohibiting the count of the county from from qualifying in, among or meeting the seven standards for ever applying for the uh, protect your neighbor uh, options or or protocols. Um, that's actually I don't know the answer. That's one of the conversations that I want to have with have with um, the county health department is to understand that because what's different about this is because of the so the wastewater testing is a bit of a nexus in terms of then they're testing, I guess, dormitories and, and other areas. Um, so the difference in this is it's not like they're just seeing widespread um, in the community. And so it, they are understanding where it's coming from. So what I don't know is, is that difference, does it make, does it change how we look at protect our neighbor? But that's actually um, after this afternoon, move to the top of my list as a follow-up conversation with them so I can understand it. As soon as we know, we'll let you know. Yeah, thanks. I, it's obviously, to the degree that people, you know, would like to see us get to that phase, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the burden obviously falls to the university uh, to do what's necessary to help so that the whole county, right, could qualify and, and apply for that, that status. So, and, and and, and to add on to that, the state and the county are, they're all working on dashboards so we can understand where we are. Um, and that's part of the question is to understand the impact. Because if you remember some of the criteria, what's it, it's continuing to change is X number of days with a decreasing caseload. And so we had really been on that trajectory. And what I don't know is, does this start us over again? Or is this where we, we, you know, we have X days and then after this, we're building on to that. So that's some of the specific questions that I need to get answered. Uh, that'll be helpful to get, to get that information. Thanks. Joan? I'm oh, sorry, Councilor yeah, Brooke. Exactly. It's okay. <laughs> so um, as we watch this nationwide and, and look at the spike, a lot of them nationally are coming from uh, universities and the opening of colleges. Um, I've also heard uh, the discussion that sending these grad these uh, students home is also going to add to a problem that they are carrying this back. So my question is, has the university or the county thought about uh, doing a quarantine dorm so that we don't put the infected people back into a community? It would seem like this might come under the protect our neighbor uh, mandate as well. But I, I'm just curious if you've heard whether we're going to have, they're having a quarantine dorm or are they sending these kids back home? So I don't know what they're doing per se. Um, tomorrow I have, um, every Wednesday, I have a conversation with uh, the, the other uh, managers within Boulder County and Jane's on that conversation. So that was gonna be one of my questions Great. because I know they're more in contact with the city of Boulder um, I do know that when they identify someone that they then have to quarantine themselves, um, okay. and, but I don't know what they're doing. Um, and it, it, you know, multiple schools are doing different things. Exactly. Some are canceling, some are quarantining. Um, so it's, it's different at all in, in, in various university settings. But, but again, I'll know more. It was just one of those with the holiday yesterday, our conversations occurred today. Normally we'd wanna, and <laughs> And one of my uh, amazing teammates just said, CU does have dorms set up for quarantine um, I, and isolation. So Marika, just so you all know, Marika is the one that just sent me this. Marika is on the GIST team. Okay. And so she's interacting with, with them on a much regular, on a regular basis. Um, and she doesn't know the number, of, the number of rooms, but they do have that set up. So I'm assuming somebody tests positive, they're getting moved 
the question is what capacity do they have? And um, I think we're all hearing that in terms of enforcement, they're getting pretty aggressive in Boulder. Okay. You all may have seen the article where I believe it was $11,000 in fines to fraternities and sororities or that was in the newspaper. So I, I know they're taking it serious and I'll have more information from Jane tomorrow. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I would like to point out that CU also has its own hospital where I spent my winter break one year. <laughs> uh, so they are well equipped to, to take care of it. I hope they do a good job. All right, Harold, anything else? No, just that I wanted to let council know we are watching this. We are staying on top of it and we'll provide you with more information as that becomes available. All right, when we have no special reports or presentations, correct? Uh, no, sir. All right, then let's go ahead and move on to first call public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead and take a two minute break while people get in the queue and then we'll be back. For those of you who are calling in tonight, we've just let you in the meeting. We are still on hold. We will get to you one at a time. Please focus on your audio in your phone that you've used to call in. Do not follow the live stream. Please mute that. It will get confusing. We will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number one at a time. Please be ready to unmute yourself at the time we call you out. Thank you. Again, welcome to all of those that have just joined us using your telephone. Please mute the live stream. When we begin calling you, we will call you out by the last three digits of your phone number, one at a time. If we do not see that you're unmuting yourself in a timely manner, we will come back to you and take the, uh, the next caller. 
please be patient with us. Again, please mute your live stream so that you are hearing us through your phone. Thank you. Mayor, I'm gonna give it about 30 seconds so that the slide will leave the live stream and then we can begin with our public invited to be heard. two, three, four, five, six, seven. Cool. Let's go ahead and throw up the first public invited to be heard speaker. All right. Caller whose phone number ends in six, eight, seven. I'm going to ask wait. you. You have to wait 30 seconds, right? No, Mayor, uh, the slide has already what? left the screen. We should be ready to go. What I mean, isn't there a 30 second delay if they're watching? Right. They should be listening to their audio in their phone. So I think we're good to go. All right, let's give it a shot. And then how many are in the queue? Steph, did you count? We have 10 in the queue. Perfect. Let's go for it. All right. Caller ending in 687. It looks like you've unmuted yourself. Please uh, state your name, your address for the record. You have three minutes. All right. Thank you. Um, so my name is John Catone, and I lived at, live at 948 11th Avenue in Longmont. Uh, and thanks for your time tonight. I'm calling to ask council to reconsider their recent motion vote on short-term rentals, um, specifically the one that eliminates the ability for Longmont residents to rent out one investment property. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm one of those owners who rents out an investment property as an Airbnb. Um, I opened my small business around this in October 
uh, using our first investment home. And I use that business to spend more time at home with my kids now and to still have enough income to continue living in our neighborhood. Um, we live in the same neighborhood uh, that the Airbnb exists in. Uh, so asking you to reconsider the vote, I have a few points I'd like you to consider uh, in support of keeping the code the way it is today. Um, so my, my first point, um, that motion vote, I think would harm or eliminate about a dozen locally owned small businesses, just like mine, that are licensed businesses, uh, based on the list we were able to receive from code enforcement. Um, each of us has invested some tens and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars into starting these businesses. And we've done this based on the fact that in 2017, council explicitly allowed these types of businesses. So that's my first point, I think. Um, it really pulls the rug out from under us uh, since we've invested time and money thinking that these businesses would be legal. And now we're facing the prospect of maybe not recouping our investments. Um, the second point I'd like to consider, um, this motion makes Longmont less affordable for us as middle-class small business owners. Um, and not only that, but it has a negative halo effect on local economic activity. So our business would no longer be hiring services like local cleaners and yard maintenance. And the travelers who come and patronize our business, those travelers that prefer this type of lodging, would no longer be spending their money in our neighborhood restaurants and shops. Um, a third point I'd like council to consider, um, there's kind of a legal question about this type of code change that's come up um, within a group of us. Uh, so this type of code change kind of takes away our property rights as well, which were established when the original code was released in 2017. So now that we've invested in our businesses, invested in our second properties and established and settled new property rights, um, is council able to take those away? Would the courts support that? Um, I know of a court case in Austin, Texas, where their city council made the exact same change and their state courts struck down that change, um, considering those established property rights. Sir, sir, I love what you're saying, yep. but it's it's over three yep. minutes. I'm going to have to cut you off. Sorry. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, guys. All right. Thank you. Next. Caller whose phone number ends in 191. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and your address for the record, please. And you have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Hello? Well, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, in 2018, I came before the Council twice to plead my case regarding owning a second home and being able to rent on a short-term basis. My name is Ted Rietzma, and I reside at 155 Sunset. And then back then, the council decided it was okay for us to continue our business as long as we reside in Longmont and only own one income property, get a permit, and pay lodging and sales tax. As soon as your ruling became law, we immediately went to the city. We paid and were issued the third STR permit and then applied and were granted a sales tax license. Since then, we have paid the city over $3,500 in sales and lodging taxes, not including the exorbitant property taxes we have paid since acquiring this home. And it has come to my attention that you would like to revisit this ruling and if possible, make amends to it, potentially eliminating the opportunity to a second home by a resident for short-term rental income. As I previously stated to the council back then, we happened to inherit this home with a substantial mortgage from my wife's mother. With the pandemic upon us, we have had numerous cancellations this year in the amount of over $22,000. Unfortunately, we have had to take out a loan to cover the mortgage and utilities, and it's still not enough to cover our losses. Now it seems you'd like to take away any chance of recovery we are still holding on to because for a few members of the community and a few members of the council, renting a second home short term should now be illegal. 
Upon reviewing all of the issued SDR permits, there are only a handful of permitted owners that actually reside in Longmont and who use their second home for income. Now, I understand the thinking of some people that short-term rentals are just party houses, do nothing good for the neighborhood or community, and they should be banned altogether. But that is not the case for the majority of the public and us short-term rental owners. We have never had a single problem with our neighbors or the city, and our neighbors look out for our home when it is vacant. They welcome all of our guests with open arms, and our guests return the favor. The reviews by our guests is nothing but praise for our community. There's been plenty of times after our guest checkout that we have seen empty shoe boxes from Browns or pizza boxes from Rosalie's and other businesses. I do believe it is the right thing to make sure everyone is up to code and compliant with all the local rules and regulations. But if you do decide to reverse your ruling from 2018, please consider us homeowners that actually abide by the rules <coughs> and have done nothing wrong to continue doing business with the city and guests and maybe even bring up the possibility of grandfathering us original applicants into the new ordinance. Um, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, sir. Next. Okay. Caller whose phone number ends in 452. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Caller ending in 452, can you please try to unmute yourself? Okay. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council members. Sherry Malloy, 2113 Rangeview Lane. I'm calling in to speak to item 9C, updating the development code to include protections of riparian area, areas, habitat, and species. Two years ago, council approved the first set of major updates to Longmont's LDC in 17 years. At that time, council directed staff to include several riparian protection amendments and to develop a sustainability evaluation tool. As a result, this section of the updates was delayed. The wildlife management plan was completed last fall and has informed the LDC. This ordinance is ready to go and will help protect riparian areas, wetlands, streams, creeks, open space, and the wildlife that depends on all these. The 2021 budget is also on your agenda. When COVID hit, the posting for a full-time environmental planner got pulled. Yet for the last six months and beyond, development continues at a rapid pace. Hiring an environmental planner must be a top priority or this ordinance is not going to be effective. Similarly, Similarly, with COVID limiting activities, people are accessing all aspects of nature, often accessing it to death. You know the tremendous increase in use, overuse, and often abuse to all our natural places by a variety of people and for a variety of reasons. The harmful impacts are not only very expensive to repair, but in many cases will take years and even decades to recover. Desperately needed are resources for education, advocacy and enforcement to protect these places now. Although Council and Herald have recognized the need, there is no FTE in the budget for a volunteer coordinator. Danielle's position is split between project manager and volunteer coordinator. That's impossible as both positions have become more than full-time in the last six months with no end in sight. The return on the financial investment of a full-time volunteer coordinator is exponential with the cost to repair and restore damaged areas dwarfing a salary cost. Volunteers are essential for healthy communities. People from all walks of life donate their time and effort to make commitments, share expertise, learn, take responsibility, and feel pride for their contribution to the greater good. Needed now is monitoring, gathering data, doing restoration, and especially park rangers. Everyone wants a healthy community, a peaceful place where people and wildlife live in harmony. We all have ideas about how to make that happen. The big question is who will make that happen? Volunteers can. All of you have expressed your intention to respect and protect our natural public amenities, which is fabulous. Tonight you can do so by codifying safeguards in the LDC. 
And to enforce this ordinance effectively, an environmental planner needs to be in the budget and to protect our natural areas, a 0.5 volunteer coordinator position also. Thank you. Thanks again, Shari. Just an aside, I, you are always on three minutes, exactly. Next caller. All right, caller whose number ends in 499. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and your address for the record, and you have three minutes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can can hear you hear me? Yes, okay, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. This is Doe Kelly from Barberry Drive in Longmont. Okay. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Longmont City Council. Several of us spoke to you in person at the council meeting in February on the dangers of microwave radiation, the same radiation that smart meters emanate 24-7. At that time, to my recall, we brought each of you a copy of a white paper from 2012, authored by Dr. Timothy Shackley in collaboration with the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy called Getting Smarter About the Smart Grid. And for reference sake, for anyone listening who would like to read Tim's paper, you can find it online with a quick search of the title Getting Smarter About the Smart Grid. As you are aware, Tim Shekely is an international expert in wired and wireless communications who has engineered the development of electric utility gateways and energy management, management systems for over 30 years. He is well known and regarded in his field. He is an expert's expert who lives in our own backyard. Tim has repeatedly told me that the AMI will be obsolete in three to five years. Does Longmont really want to invest its $7.5 million allocated for AMI and soon to be obsolete technology, according to Tim, or do we want to look further into the future to solutions that will give us more than we already imagine? To quote Buckminster Fuller, you never change things by fighting existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Interestingly, that is exactly what Tim has done with his EMMA, an acronym for Energy Management and Metering Architecture, which is soon to be featured in an article in Solar Today. And if you don't already have a copy of Tim's latest revision of the EMMA paper, you soon will. Now, why would we want to listen to Tim Sheckley? Duncan Campbell Esquire of Boulder wrote this about Tim in the foreword to the above mentioned white paper. Dr. Timothy Sheckley has been a friend and colleague for nearly 25 years. I served as corporate legal counsel when he founded a company whose primary focus was on designing home automation systems and specifically on developing communication gateways and energy management systems employing demand response. He was also involved in the early development of standards for and testing of smart meters, including advanced metering infrastructure or AMI. He became a pioneer of such energy management systems and gateways with his early cutting edge smart home product. His extensive knowledge and wisdom and systems thinking in this area has been garnered in large part from his deep involvement in smart grid technology and in taking a leading role in the development and writing of formal national and international standards for close to 30 years. As such, he is uniquely qualified to have formulated this exceptional and game-changing critical analysis, getting smarter about the smart grid. We're gonna, we're gonna ma'am, we're gonna have to cut you off. That's, that's over three minutes, but we appreciate your comments. One question, how many of you have read the paper? And if you haven't, I would urge you to. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Councilman Martin. I've read the paper. Read Thank you. All right, next caller. All right, caller whose number ends in 777. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members. My name is Aiden Melendez. I'm at 1543 South Kaufman. I'm, in call, I'm calling in to voice our concerns on the amount of traffic and the unsafe speed of, the, of traffic coming to our neighborhood on South Kaufman Street. 
we moved into, into South Coffin in 1981. After looking at other neighborhoods, our family chose South Moore Park because of how the neighborhood felt. It was very welcoming, quiet, and calm. Uh, the street was very clean, well kept, and as I mentioned, it was very welcoming. We noticed the street was wide and it was common to see the neighbors out close to the street having conversations with each other. There was a lot of traffic and it felt very safe. Talking to each other across the street, drivers usually waved at each other because we all knew the neighbors and their vehicles. We have gotten accustomed, accustomed to the slight increase in traffic when Prospect was developed, but now it has become like a speedway through our neighbor, neighborhood because it is wide and it is downhill. With the light and the collector street designation, it has become unsafe and I have actually experienced where we have motion, motioned with our hands to, uh, to slow drivers down uh, because of the kids in the neighborhood and, and drivers have actually uh, sped up. We as residents at Southmore Park are asking that there is some consideration in how our neighborhood and our lives are now being impacted. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next caller. Caller whose number ends in 949. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record, and you will have three minutes. Hello? We can hear you. Hello. Oh, hi. This is Ruby Bowman, 1512 Left Hand Drive, Longmont. Mayor Bagley and council members, I hope you got a chance to read my comments I sent you about the updated riparian code and the 2021 budget. Please implement my recommendations and address specific issues I brought up in my comments. I would also like to re reiterate the importance of filling the environmental sustainability planner position. Please hire the environmental planner as soon as possible and approve the position for 2021. And finally, Longmont needs more park rangers. Let's not go through another year where we have to, where we don't have enough rangers to protect the city's natural resources and to handle the large influx of people into our parks, greenways, and open space. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Ruby. Next caller. Caller whose number ends in 323. Three. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Simo, 525 East 16th Avenue. Thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members, for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm here to ask you to enact the changes to Chapter 15.05.020. 15.05.030 and 15.10.020 of the municipal code that city staff have worked on for the last year. These changes will better protect our creeks, streams, wetlands, riparian areas, and those species utilizing those habitats. I also strongly urge you to push the city to fill the environmental planner position that was advertised, but that was pulled due to the pandemic. Development and construction has progressed despite COVID-19, and the city needs someone whose main job is to review development applications with an eye toward how those developments will impact our natural area. I also strongly urge you to encourage the hiring of additional park rangers to enforce city policies protecting our natural areas. As we've seen since the pandemic hit, residents have flocked to Longmont's open spaces in the absence of other recreational opportunities, and they haven't always treated our natural areas with the respect and care they deserve. Stronger protections can only go so far if there aren't enough people to enforce those protections. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next caller. Caller whose number ends in 618. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and please state your name and address for the record. And you have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? We, we can hear you. Dear Longmont City Council, my name is Noah Mattinger and I reside at 2200 Spencer Street. As I'm starting the application process for my short-term rental, I was appalled to learn that this council is considering taking away the rights of property owners by limiting and preventing short-term rentals. This so-called policy consideration 
seems like such a knee-jerk, poorly thought out, whimsical reaction that I can't believe it's even being given the time of day. But here we are. So since we're gonna discuss this, I insist that you consider these points to better understand the shortcomings of this policy change. Number one, first, just who are these short-term rentals? These are our friends and family. For many, for many of these visitors, it is their first time to Longmont and to the front range. They spend money at local restaurants, they have fun in local bars and breweries, and they go to the Rocky Mountain National Park and make memories, which they will cherish for life. In short, these are the people and tourists our city needs, especially during this time of economic hardship. Number two, if Longmont can address this needed service, they will go elsewhere. Are we so naive to think that these visitors will still spend their money at our businesses if we cannot provide them with short-term stays? No, if Loveland or Lyons or Estes Park has short-term rentals, they will spend their money there. I would, you would. Let's not kid ourselves. Short-term rentals provide a home-like atmosphere. Short-term rentals will not check into local hotels. We will simply lose the economic opportunity. Closing the door to short-term rentals is closing the doors to Longmont businesses and to Longmont's prosperity. Three, the majority of short-term renters are families. People love them and people love it when their families can stay close. To me, it seems that the council believes short-term renters are composed of undesirables and problematic people. Yet need I remind the council that many of our city's workers are short-term renters themselves. And I sincerely hope that this bias does not extend to these fine people. Number four, it is only a small percentage of homes that even provide short-term rentals. There are just nine, I believe. But now you're considering eliminating this. It's not even a problem. In fact, you ought to be supporting this as it brings money to our community. Last of all, and most of all, this policy is an insult to our hopes and dreams. We invested in private property to make our lives better and in pursuit of happiness. And we chose Longmont as our home. I implore you, oppose this restriction on short-term rentals and do not allow it to move forward any further. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. All right, next caller. We have what, two left? Uh, we have one caller left, Mayor. All right, let's hear what he or she has to say. Caller whose number ends in 556. Five, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Claudia Smith. Um, I currently live in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, the reason that I'm calling is I just want to provide my experience, talk about my experience as a Airbnb customer. Um, last year, from July 7th to, to the 12th, um, we were having a hard time to find an Airbnb to spend the time in Colorado. So. We found a beautiful place in Longmont, beautiful house. And um, that gave us the opportunity uh, for my family and I to uh, get to know the area. We, we fall in love with uh, Longmont. Uh, we were able to feel like we were local people. We were walking in the streets, enjoying the parks. We went to the restaurants. We enjoy the shopping around the area, and in general, we enjoy the culture around Longmont. So um, what I'm trying to say with this is we, we love it so much that we even try to live in that area. Unfortunately, um, the things, um, my husband's job situation in the school for my kids, um, we were not able to move to Longmont. But we, I mean, if, if I ever come back to Colorado, Lomond definitely is the place that I will go first. After living five years in Erie, I live in Erie, I live in Thornton, and nothing compares with the feeling that you get by living in Lomond. So all this, all this, my opinion is based because I live 
for a few days, like almost a week, in one of the Airbnb's homes in Longmont. And um, last year, um, like I said, we, um, because the school of my kids, we had to move to Thornton, but that didn't stop us to still be sitting in Longmont, enjoying the re local restaurants, enjoying the bars, enjoying all what Longmont is providing. So um, I gotta say that you guys have a great community and this is the main reason of my call. So just to let you know the importance, important, how important it is for us as a family that you guys provide this kind of service. There is no way that living in a hotel will enjoy as much as we did in an Airbnb home. So that's all what I have to say and thank you for, for listening. Thank you, ma'am. All right, that, that is it, right, for the queue? Yeah, that's correct, that's it. All right, then let's move on to the consent agenda. Would you go ahead and read that for us, Ms. Quintana? Of course, Mayor. Item 9A is Ordinance 2020-35, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of the City of Longmont, Colorado, Open Space Sales and Use Tax Revenue Refunding and Improvement Bonds, Series 2020. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for September 22nd, 2020. 9B is Ordinance 2020-36, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for September 22nd, 2020. 9C is Ordinance 2020-37, a bill for an ordinance repealing and reenacting Chapter 15.05.020 of the Longmont Municipal Code on the protection of streams and creeks, wetlands, riparian areas, and 15.05.030 on habitat and species protection, and amending chapters 15.08.070 on non-conforming structures, and 15.10.020 on all other terms defined. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for September 22nd, 2020. 9D is Resolution 2020-88, a resolution of the Longmont City Council adopting a revised investment policy for the city. 9E is Resolution 2020-89, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the United States Bureau of Reclamation for a Water Smart grant. 9F is Resolution 2020-90, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District for water quality monitoring regarding compounds of emerging concern. Resolution 9G is Resolution 2020-91, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the Federal Aviation Administration for a grant to improve the runway safety area at the Vance Brand Municipal Airport. And 9H is resolution 2020-92, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the State of Colorado for grant funding for the Rewind program. All right, thank you very much. Councilmember Christensen? Uh, I would like to pull uh, 9C for a discussion and 9H just for a comment. All right. Can we have a motion? All right, I'm going to actually move the consent agenda less C and H. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right. Paul, was that an aye for you? Was that an aye for you? Yes. All right, uh, the, uh, the motion cast passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to ordinances on second reading. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a two minute break and we'll ask uh, folks to call in. If you are calling for, for uh, section 10 ordinances on second reading and public hearings, um, you'll need to call in now and uh, get in the queue. And then once we have the queue lined up, we're gonna go ahead and zip through these, I hope. So um, let's go ahead and see you in two minutes.
Okay, are we here? Eric, give us just 30 seconds now to let the slide leave the live stream and then we'll begin. We have two callers. One of them, uh, we admitted they were still hanging out in the waiting area from the last uh, public invited to be heard section. So I don't know if they have anything they want to say regarding yes. this public hearing, but we will ask them. Steph, are you prepared? Yeah. Mayor, we can begin when you're ready. All right, let's go ahead with uh, item 10A, ordinance 2020-34, a bill for an ordinance amending section 4.16.010 of the Loma Municipal Code on allowable investments. Are there any questions from council? All right, I'm not seeing any. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-34. Sorry, Councilmember Christensen. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with um, the fact that we are taking, we are adding as good investments, uh, municipal bonds and mortgage backed securities, which were two of the things that, you know, which under good circumstances um, would be fine. However, you know, they have proven to be uh, very, both of them have proven to be very problematic in times of financial meltdowns. And um, so, I'm just wondering if um, we could get a little bit of reassurance from Jim Golden that he actually thinks these are good ideas. Mayor Bagley, members of the council, this is Jim Golden, the chief financial officer. So the only thing we're adding here actually is municipal bonds. We have been investing in more mortgage backed securities um, for some time, sorry, I have to put my video on. I missed that, and so, um, and and so, I guess I, I we're pretty confident we we are in, invested in uh, AAA type investments when it comes to these securities that are mortgage backed through federal instrumentalities. Uh, as far as the municipal bonds go, again, we would only be looking at the highly rated municipal bonds. Um, so we have those built into that investment policy that you actually just acted on. We have those uh, limits on, on how high those need to be graded. So we don't get into any junk type bonds or junk documents that, um, that would be more of a high risk to the to city. Okay, thanks, Jim. I, uh, you know, muni bonds are usually pretty, pretty safe. I mean, if the, if the, but we've already, we've also seen this happen in other times, but I'm glad for that explanation. So if you're comfortable with it, I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and continue with the public hearing. Is, are there, is there anybody who would like to speak at this public hearing? We have two callers, Mayor. Do any one of them want to speak on ordinance 2020-34? Caller whose phone number ends in 499, if you could please um, state your name and your address for the record. And if would you like to speak on this ordinance? Caller 499, you were in our waiting room. And we let you back in. If you do not want to talk at this point of the meeting, we'll just ask you to hang up. Steph, go ahead and try and unmute her again or him. I'm listening to the video. Let's move on to the next caller and then we'll put both of them back in the waiting room when the next caller is done. Caller whose number ends in 418. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself, please, and please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, this is Stan Toll. I probably didn't wanna talk on this one. Uh, I'm interested in the RV ordinance um, and uh, that's what I'd like to talk on but uh, um, this is kind of, I got kicked out of the public right to be heard 
uh, because, um, you know, you grab the phone and it, you hang up and then you can't get back on again. Hey, Stan, go, go ahead and take your three minutes. It's free speech. It's a public hearing. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Brian, you know, I, I checked the local ordinances and they said, well, I can ask you guys questions, but uh, this is on this RV thing. And we're right in the middle of a pandemic. And some people have more than enough time to get themselves busy and make special contact with uh, uh, the public officials like yourself. Other people um, are not, particularly people that are living in vehicles. Um, and they require special um, efforts to make sure that they come in and they have input into this. this. And, you know, the city has been very harsh on people of lower income, things like excluding them from housing by not accepting Section 8 and all sorts, all the way back to uh, if you had skin was too brown, you had to leave the town before sundown. So my thing is, is that you need to get people that are being affected by this ordinance involved. You have to make special contact with these people and work out something that people that no longer have housing and are using vehicles as residents, you know, are not being treated like some sort of criminals where their property is being taken and they're being thrown in jail just for trying to live. That's my uh, two cents worth on that. All right, great. Thanks, Dan. All right, unless there's anybody else in the queue, which it doesn't sound like there is, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Can we have a motion regarding Ordinance 2020-34? All right, Dr. Waters? Uh, I'll move. I just, not, we just, when you put, bring that screen up, I can't thank you. I'll move approval of Ordinance 2020-34. Second. Reading. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Councilmember Edago. Actually, Edago Faring, was that you? Okay, seconded by Councilmember Edago Faring. Um, seeing no for the comment or discussion, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, Ordinance 2020 34 passes uh, unanimously. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to 10B approve amended council rules of procedure, Rule 27, regarding boards. Are there any questions? Councilmember Christensen. And just full of questions tonight. Um, I would like something clarified on page, <clears throat> well, if this is uh, page 10 of our rules of procedure, <clears throat> we're um, suggesting that when there are fewer applications than seats available, council may make reappointments based solely on the application without requiring an interview of applicants. Does that mean that if this is a, um, that we could appoint somebody even though we've never, they aren't serving currently on the board, we would appoint them just based on the fact that there are more open seats? If so, I think that's a bad idea to just appoint somebody because without an interview, without, uh, ever talking to them at all, based purely on the application. If it, it means that they already are on the board and have served for a while on that board, um, I, I'm fine with that. Mayor Bagley, Council Member Christensen, Don Quintana, City Clerk. Uh, that, um, as we understand that uh, paragraph, that's paragraph I that you're referring to uh, of Rule 27, we understand that to be about reappointment. So you would only be looking at those who you have already interviewed who are currently serving that have applied to continue their service. So you would have had a chance to interview them already. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure. Thank You're you. welcome. Joan, is your hand up or are you just- I'm just holding just, my head up. Just, just posing, <laughs> just posing for the camera. Okay, all right. Um, then seeing no further discussion, uh, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Is there anybody in the queue, Don? Mayor, there is not. Uh, the right. meeting's been unlocked since the last public hearing. All right, let's go ahead and close the public hearing then. Can we have a motion? Councilmember Christensen? Um, <clears throat> I move um, um, 
2024B. Uh, I think, I think, uh, I, okay, I'll second that. I'll re, I'll take the motion as a motion to approve the amended council rules of procedure, specifically rule 27 regarding boards second. or item 10B. Second. All right, okay. It's been moved by Councilor Christensen. It's been seconded by Dr. Waters. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, let's move back. Uh, Councilmember Christensen, let's go ahead and hear your statement on H. Let's get that one out of the way quick. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was very happy to see this uh, uh, happen again. Um, just for the public, uh, this is a really good program, the Rewind program. Um, it was uh, the federal government put a hold on it because they were angry at Colorado standing up for immigrants. And so they weren't going to fund it. And uh, we had to sue them and we won the lawsuit. And so now we are back with the Rewind program, which is a very good program to keep, to help people who, uh, help young people who have wound up in, well, have needs for um, help of all kinds uh, regarding the legal system. And this will keep them from continuing to get in trouble with the legal system and help them in many other ways to get a, a good start. And so I was very happy to see this coming back. It's uh, terrific, thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks Mayor Bagley. Um, I wasn't gonna pull this off, but but if in the event somebody had, did pull it off, I do have a question that, I, that, I, that occurred to me. Um, and that is, first of all, I want to uh, ditto what Councilmember Christensen expressed about appreciation for this, the stand the state took and the, and the willingness of, the, of Colorado to act on principle and the language um, that was in this program. Um, because we've done a program evaluation, we brought in an external evaluator of the Rewind program and now with a grant to continue the program. Um, um, I, I visited with Harold earlier today about when we would have a chance not to see the results of the program evaluation, because I don't think that's our business. But I do think it's our business to get briefed on what did the staff learn from that evaluation that they'll apply as we, as we approve a new grant as the program no, now moves forward. You know, when will when we, when we have a chance to, to share basically what you learn and how you're going to use what you learn to get better? Aaron, do you want to jump in and then I'll jump in? Um, you bet, Mayor and, uh, and Dr. Waters and council members. So um, what our plan would be is to come back in uh, a, a meeting in October to um, kind of depending on what the, you know, what the agendas are, but to, uh, to share the results and what we've learned and how we are uh, applying that to the program. So, um, so we, we understand that council was interested in that and um, our intent would be to bring that back in an appropriate meeting in October to do that. Uh, this is something that, that, that this is of something, because I, I, uh, I'm all for restorative justice. I'm all for keeping our kids out of the system, et cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested in hear what we discovered too, because I know if you'll recall um, it's all fine and dandy. I want to take the money. I want to make the program better. But I do know that there were some concerns after the fact. Anyway, there were some concerns before the, the evaluation was done. There's concerns after. And so um, we'll just wait till October to hear that. So thank you very much. Polly, do you want to, you pulled it. Do you want to make a motion? Yeah. I moved it in a different place. Um, I would, now I've lost my place. Uh, okay, <laughs> I would move resolution 2020-92. Second. I was first on the second, but I was muted. So we'll go ahead and give that to Councilmember Martin. <laughs> all right, Councilmember Christensen made a motion. It was seconded by Councilmember Martin. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. 
All right, resolution 2020-92 passes unanimously. All right, Polly, let's go ahead and address ordinance 2020-37. Polly? Yes, just having trouble unmuting myself. Um, okay, so um, I believe all of us received a letter from uh, Ruby Bowman today. And um, I think there are many good things in it. Um, I don't agree with everything, but I do think that it would be worth discussing since this is our opportunity to discuss it. Um, item one was um, features subject to setbacks. <clears throat> um, I would like to clarify that we aren't really going to, she brings up a, the point of native roots. Now native roots have, is of course in Boulder County land and it is on their private property, the sign. So there isn't really anything we can do about that. But I, I do imagine that somewhere in the code, it does not actually allow people to put advertising signs up on the greenway. Is that correct? If it isn't, we should sort of, you know, put that up. Mayor. Does anybody Bag know? I'm done. Okay. Mayor Bagley, Council Member Mark Christensen, members of the Council, Don Burchett, Planning Manager. So the Land Development Code would not allow for a sign uh, to be put on any of the city property, the Greenway, for any kind of business like that. So that so that would not be allowed. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought. Um, so um, the second item is reduced setbacks. And she suggests adding um, concentration of rare native fish uh, because that is something that we don't have in there. And uh, key, the quote, um, the, the words, key use areas for migrant songbirds and key nesting areas for grassland birds. Um, I would suggest we consider adding those two items to the reduced setbacks section. Um, I would move, I would make a motion that we add the phrases concentrations of rare native fish and the phrase key use areas for migrant songbirds and key nesting areas for grassland birds. Do I have a second? Uh, uh, Councilmember Hidalgo Ferry? Second it. All right, there's a motion on the table. I didn't catch exactly the language that we were providing. Okay. Um, I, I, no, no, no. I, I mean, what I'm saying is I, I understood what the gist was. I just can't repeat it saying as the chair, hey, there's a motion and here it is. I'm going to have you repeat the language when it comes time to vote, Councilmember. Okay. Um, but I guess my only, my only concern is um, I, I would wish, me personally, it would be a lot easier, I think, for legal staff. Um, I view the first and second readings as the first one is for discussion. Second one should be just for approval. And, um, and uh, this, I think this would be a lot easier on legal if we could bring these things up um, on first reading and, instead of the second. But let's go ahead. Can you go ahead and just repeat what the motion was, Polly? Please, just the language. And and I see your point, Mayor Bagley. I do. But we, if you remember this discussion with Councilman Santos, we went round and round and round about. I'm I'm not I, yeah I'm, yeah I'm not trying to I'm not trying I'm just saying I just want I'm just I'm just trying to get it right. So get the language out there and let's let's hear it one more time, please. I get it. Okay, so the. Item uh, for item five of this section include the phrase concentrations of rare native fish to the list of species habitat features. One more time. Sorry, I'm sorry. Concentration, the phrase is concentration of rare native fish. And where would that go? Could you read it into the, the how would it read? Go in, in item words? five of the reduced setbacks. Could you read it for us, please? How would, it, how would it read? I don't have that in front of me. <laughs> I could probably look that, 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 That's all right. That's all right. And then, so you're just saying, uh, just Councilman Martin, I'm sorry. Do you have it? No, I don't. I was getting ready for the discussion. 
Oh, okay. All right. So you're basically just saying that we add that section to the areas that are protected? Add that phrase to um, reduce the reduced setback section item five. All right. And then what was the other one? The other one is also for the reduced setbacks item five. The phrase is key use areas for migrant songbirds and key nesting areas for grassland birds. Um, these are two things that are in the Fort Collins land use code. And we do have songbirds and grassland birds here that need to what right. And then so what would the what would the motion do? Meaning what, what is it? The phrase key use areas for migrant songbirds and key nesting areas for grassland birds to the reduced setback section number V or four. Right, so it would be, so we couldn't, we would not be encroaching upon these areas? Right. All right, Eugene, do you have any, how, how bad your stomach twisting right now? <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, we also have Teresa Tate on, Deputy City Attorney who worked on this ordinance. I think I've got it, I think I'm on page 204 okay. of the packet and there is a list of habitat features being protected by this ordinance and to that we would add concentrations of rare native fish and migratory and songbirds as Okay. I don't have Ruby's email, so I, that, that's I, right. But, okay, that, that, that makes sense. So basically, okay, that, that, okay, all right. Now at least, at least, we at least understand now what we're going to be voting on. I think so. That's good. I like songbirds and grassland birds. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Councilman Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Mr. Burchette, um, <laughs> do we not have um, blanket language that? requires any application for a variance, which is what a reduced setback would be, um, to have an evaluation of, it, of sensitive wildlife and uh, habitat already that does not require an enumeration, or am I out of date on that? Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, members of Council, we have the ability to request that all of our reports look at and identify any um, species or animals on the property. The, the trick, I think, and, and the concern from the, the people that um, have some concerns with the way this is not as specific is that sometimes we do not know of all of the species that are on a property. So we are dependent upon natural resources staff and David Bell's group to help us identify and make sure that those reports have looked at all aspects of the property. As an example, the, the fish species that may be in a section of the creek or river. So it doesn't give me heartburn to add this into the ordinance um, as a portion or as a criteria for the council to consider when you're looking at whether or not to grant a variance. And I think in some respects, it does give the council additional information that if there were a sensitive or an endangered fish, for example, in this section of Creek where someone was trying to get a variance that that would potentially do irreparable harm, it would be a way for you to make that decision and deny that variance along with the evaluation system through the SES. So, I don't see a problem with adding that language if the council chooses to do so, but I do think the code allows us to ask anybody to expand upon their reports to address these kinds of issues, but I, I don't see a harm in adding this. Okay, well that, that was my question was, is the, does the SES not already allow um, us to bring in our parks and wildlife specialists to um, to evaluate whether this is necessary or not. And as um, part of, and Councilmember Martin, you, you are correct, as part of the SES, part of the evaluation that takes place, we 
use David Bell and his staff in doing those analysis for the SES that the council would review. So we have that ability right now. Okay, so that, that was my point was that it doesn't seem, there's nothing wrong with it. It just seems superfluous because we already have the ability to protect those populations. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Um, I believe this is brought up because the, the only way we know what, we don't do the consultation. The developers hire a consultant and the consultants are varying degrees of uh, quality like any other profession. And some of them are not really aware of some of these things. So the only way we would be aware of the actual wildlife on the property is through the consultant. And you don't want the consultant to, the developer to waste money having to go back and get the consultant to do another review of stuff. We want this just to be upfront. They know that they should be looking for this sort of thing. This is not necessarily something that we, uh, that, that um, all consultants, environmental consultants are aware of. One would think they would be, but that's, you know, that's not always true. Um, and it's also to draw us into alignment with the county comprehensive plan and um, um, that would be a good thing. That would be better for us to approach these things um, on a countywide basis because the birds fly all over the county. So, you know, um, <laughs> why not just be specific enough to begin with? Saves everyone time and money. All right. Okay, so there's a motion on the table. All in favor? Oh, sorry, Dr. Waters. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I have no reason to not think this is a good idea. I just would like to hear, since David's name has been used several times, do we have anybody on this in this session from uh, our natural resources group that, that has, a, has a thought about this or uh, guidance or comment? I see David now there. Would be good to hear from David before we cast a vote. Yeah, Mayor Councilman Waters. Um, I think everything that's been said is, is, is accurate, that um, superfluous is probably a better word than belts and suspenders, but that's kind of what it is. The, the rules are there. We can enforce it. And I would say you do have good wildlife staff that when we do have documents coming in from consultants along the creek and we don't see any reference to fishes, we go back to them and say, you need to look at this. So having that language there, as has been stated, may put that up front, but it's something that staff is already looking at. All right, well... So it sounds to me that if we put it in, it's no harm, no foul. It'll make Ms. Bowman happy and it won't be insulting any council member Christensen. That's what I'm hearing. So let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, there we go. We got her done. Then uh, consent item uh, C, ordinance 2020. Oh, wait, no. Uh, uh, we amended it, but we didn't pass the ordinance. The motion was just to add the language. So now do we have a, I'll move that we pass ordinance 2020-37 as amended. Second. Councilor Christensen. You're muted, Polly, sorry. I'm sure it was really funny what you said. I, yeah, I do have some more things, but if you wanna vote, well, we just did vote on this. Right, so there's a motion on the floor. Uh, to pass ordinance 2020-37 as amended. Seeing no further question, comments, or concerns, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, I'm oh, sorry, Councilmember Christensen. Do you have other amendments? Yes. All right, go ahead. Okay. Under the review procedure, I would like to add the phrase um, in consultation with the Natural Resources Division. The, the Copy right now reads, the planning director may waive or approve minor modifications of any development standard or review criteria contained in the section if the planning director finds that, blah, blah, blah. I would like to insert in consultation with the natural resources division after the planning director. That would mean who specifically? Harold, would you understand what that means? David. It just, means- ju Just David? Because the division implies a division. So in this case today it would be Joni. Um, she makes those decisions. She do, she does consult with natural resources as she's making it. This would just make that as part of the process that she right. would have to go. Is through. anyone so it's it's out it's it's 
if, it, if somebody opposed, I'd, I'd rule it out of order, but if, could we go through council member Christensen's uh, items and then include them all in one motion? If somebody has something they don't like, make a point of order and pull it out. Does that make sense? Is that okay? Don, so was that correct? I want to make sure, I need to go back. Don, was that correct? What I stated? All right. Uh, Harold, is, yes, it is. Okay. Joni okay. does consult. All right. So if you, what else you got, Polly? Okay. Um, on um, 724, oh no, on 714-2020, uh, Councilman Rodriguez um, made an amendment to the Land Development Code, which we approved. Um Hmm. Specifying that any application that comes to the Planning and Zoning Commission as an, and is adjacent to city owner operated space and parks must have city council approval. We okayed that. Um, that does not seem to be part of this. Right. Is there, is there anything else pertaining to Ordinance 2020 37? Protection of the streams and creeks and wetlands. I think that is part of this. No. Okay. Um, Mayor. Go ahead, Don. So in my council communication that was presented to the council back on July 14th, 2020, there were, that was item number seven in there. And I asked council to allow us to bring that back as a separate ordinance because oh. it would was the change was required by making changes to different sections of the land development code. The council approved all of staff's recommendations at that meeting. So we're bringing that back um, after we get this one done. We're hoping to get that along with a couple of other housekeeping items brought to you here in October. Thank you, Don. I forgot about that, so I apologize. Okay. Is there, is there something is it, else? Or is that it? Okay. So there's a motion on the table. The first, so we'll take it as a motion and I'll second it that uh, your motion was uh, to uh, to add the phrase in consultation with the natural resources division after the planning director. That's it. All in favor say aye. aye. What, what section is that? Can, can you give me a site? Don't, don't be, don't, who cares about the specifics, Eugene? Don't be a lawyer, okay? I'm just kidding. What section Mayor, was it? Council, Mayor, council members, may I, may I interject? Sure. That language is currently contained in the revisions. If you'll look at page 204 of your packet. Okay. Well, I, you know, we got to know where to put the language. And so if this isn't quite what you're looking for, let us know. But what I'm looking at is... Um, Item five, modification of the setback standard, which I believe is what council member Christensen was referring to. So if we look at 5B, increased setbacks, it states the planning and development services director in consultation with the public works and natural resources department okay. may increase the setbacks. Okay. Um, and then it, it goes on from there. But I, I believe that language is already contained in the revision. Would you agree, Polly? And then I'll call on Councilman yes. Martin. Then Tim. I think right. so. Okay, then I won't second it, but Councilman Martin. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think that Mr. Bell had it right that because uh, I read Ms. Bowman's uh, list, and it seems to me that the uh, what we're doing is is uh, taking the flexibility out of this ordinance by um, subverting the idea of having the SES tool so that it could be a living document that we would include in the evaluations, what we needed to include in the evaluations. If we um, uh, put it in the code uh, as, as specifics like population of fishes and songbirds, then we are gonna be faced with a precedent that says we have to amend this code every time 
we come up with a new sensitivity in the riparian area. Uh, whereas with the more generalized approach that we took last year, um, we can just be adaptive and, and I uh, trust Mr. Bell and his uh, staff to be on top of what needs to be done. Dr. Waters? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really making fewer, not really a comment about the, the revised ordinance. I like what's there and I, mean, I appreciate what Councilmember Martin just said, but I, if, if David and his team are comfortable with the language recommended by Ruby, that, that, that's okay with me. Um, I do think uh, Attorney Tate was spot on with her pointing us to the language in this ordinance that does exactly and, and we talked about that. I mean, that was a big deal when we saw the last draft of this and they, they picked it up. What I really want to say is this, uh, both Eugene and uh, Ms. Tate referred to a page number in their materials. And I want to say to the staff, you've constructed their materials in a different format than ours. So they refer to page 204. We don't have a page 204. Ours is organized differently. So if we're going to do it this way, it would be really good to get everybody on the same in the same format because I can tell you it's going to get real frustrating when when a staff member points me to a page and I don't have those pages in my materials because I don't because mine are formatted very differently. They're still using a Dropbox apparently with a continuous PDF. So not about substance, more about form. If we're going to have if we're going to have, have a conversation, we ought to format so we can have a conversation without trying to figure out page numbers. Thank you. All right, so there's no motion on the table other than there is a motion to pass ordinance 2020-37 as previously amended and was seconded by Councilman Martin. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-37 passes unanimously. Look at that, it's 837. All right, let's move on to, I just jinxed this, didn't I? I just jinxed this, I'm sure I did. Um, let's go ahead and move on to general business items. Um, public hearing regarding Longmont Fairgrounds Marketplace Business Improvement District, um, specifically ordinance 2020-38. It's a bill for an ordinance organizing the LFM Business Improvement District, providing for an election of the board of directors of the district and approving the 2020-2021 operating plan and budget for the district. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for September 22nd, 2020. So uh, do we have a presentation on this? I don't, I mean, I don't think we do. We did it last week, right? Tony? Um, uh, Mayor Bagley, members of council, just real quick, uh, your packet does outline rather well the uh, interest or the petition that was submitted. We did go over it. I can tell you that this is a 16 acre parcel that's on Hover Road. Uh, just south of Rogers Road and immediately north of the Home Depot property. Uh, the property in question or upon which they would establish the district is 100% commercial. And with that, we do have uh, the uh, legal counsel uh, representing the applicant. Russell Dykstra is here to uh, address any concerns or answer any questions the city council would have. And we also have a, with us tonight, Carolyn White representing the city's interests. All right. So I guess that uh, if nobody has any questions, we can go ahead and vote. I just want to, okay, well, I'm going to call on you. I just want to reiterate, and I've said this before, Tony, this is a piece of land that the city and the council, have spent, we have spent a lot of time on. It. And so uh, I just, I just want to make sure that this just isn't the next reiteration of an attempt to, to develop a piece of property that we're going to spend considerable city, considerable amounts of time and city re resources on when the, fo the, the, the folks behind it don't really have a plan of the resources. So um, you, don't need to, you don't need to respond now. It's just that um, I, I, I don't know who else I speak for, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. As soon as we, if this isn't making progress, I want to know about it so that we don't spend time on it. That makes sense. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Bagley, uh, and again, Mr. Dykstra is here. If you'd like to ask him any specific, I, I, I don't need questions. I mean, so far so good for Mr. Dykstra. It's just that uh, every time the project comes back, it's a new face, and so it's. Um, 
I'm, I'm not, I, I, I'm just letting everybody know that just if it's going to be on the agenda and we're going to be developing or contributing resources to this, I just want to make sure that the right experts and the, the consultants are in place and, and it moves along. So, uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. I have several questions. Can I run through all my, yeah, my sure. list? It's a short list, but um, to begin with, um, uh, early in the, in the council communication, we know this is true for uh, any application for a special district is um, the term extraordinary, that there's an extraordinary expense to do what has to be done. Uh, and, I, and I read in the enclosure about the infrastructure work that has to be done, the connector road, et cetera. But, but in, this, in this application, as I raised the same question when we approved the Metro District, the only one we've approved, what's the standard or criteria for extraordinary expense? Uh, we had a number in, in that application. We have a number in this application. The numbers are very different. Uh, the size of the projects, I get, I, I, I understand, are very different. One was residential, one's commercial. But that still leaves a question for me of, is there a criteria? I, Tony, is there a legal criteria? It's just kind of a, you spitball it. How do we determine what satisfies the standard of extraordinary in this, in any case? Yes. Um... Uh, Mayor Bagley, Councillor Waters. Um, in this instance, this particular district, the Business Improvement District, is not covered under our current special district ordinance. It's a totally separate requirement under state statute or allowance under state statute, I should say. Um, I could ask Carolyn White to weigh in as to what her understanding of what would constitute uh, some of the requirements of the operating plan, because again, they operate under a totally different rules than what our current ordinance allows for special districts. I get that. The rationale for the proposal is, I think, fundamentally based on the expense associated with the infrastructure development in this commercial district. And the, and the, the word is extraordinary. The number's $12 million for infrastructure cost. Uh, is there a threshold or a standard to determine what is or is not extraordinary? Or is that just a total judgment call? Well, right now, because we have no ordinance given us guidance to that uh, matter, it's pretty much open as to what constitutes that, but hopefully maybe Carolyn could just weigh in her thoughts on that matter. Carolyn? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Mayor, Council, and Dr. Waters, uh, Carolyn White, Special Counsel to Longmont for Redevelopment. And um, the term extraordinary may have been used by the applicant in their application, and we can ask them what they may, meant by that. They, they probably were referencing like relative to other developments, but as a practical matter, extraordinary is not a criterion in either the statute or your code that is applicable to this analysis. So the question isn't whether you think it's extraordinary or not, it's whether you think it's met the criteria in the state statute. And I can go through some of what those are if you would like, um, or you could ask the applicant to explain what they meant by extraordinary. That's not a legal criterion. Okay, I'll ask the applicant. Uh, I, I didn't use the term. I'd have to go back and it, maybe it was a council communication or in their, in their actual application, but that's the term. Uh, thank you, Dr. Waters. It's a good question that I've struggled with for 20 years plus of doing this. Um, each jurisdiction determines that individually. In our case, we feel that this is extraordinary because of the use of over 30% of the property for public purposes. Um, also for the cost of those public improvements, especially the regional type that don't directly benefit this property, but also benefit a larger area. Um, in, in our situation, we feel those costs and the loss of the land to make up for those costs uh, makes this an extraordinary circumstance. But generally, I agree with uh, Carolyn that there, there is no statutory criteria we can point you to. Uh, it's just a judgment call on behalf of the jurisdiction. All right, Bu building on that, and, and may, you may be the, you probably are the right person to ask, the, 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 the $12 million that was referenced and to, be, uh, to be raised through the sale of bonds, 
does that represent 100%? What percent of the total cost of, of the extraordinary cost does the $12 million represent? Well, to, to be clear, and Mr. Chacon brought this up as well, the 12 million is a max capacity for the district. We anticipate that the actual bonds that would be issued would be somewhere in that six to $7 million range. We usually include a little extra buffer in our maximum so that if circumstances change, costs increase, whatever the circumstances, we don't have to go back and get a, a subsequent approval for additional capacity. So we're, we're including about six to seven million. Um, to get to your question, even at that level, what portion of those extraordinary costs, that would cover most of those costs. And the reason why we're asking to cover most of those is because with that 30% loss of the, the developable land and such a small project, we don't have a lot of makeup room and capacity uh, in the project to fund those extraordinary costs. Um, so in this case, we're losing about three, three and a half acres of developable land due to the regional infrastructure and the road and the drainage basins. So normally a developer could absorb some portion of that by selling that three and a half acres to help offset those costs. In this case, there's only 16 acres total. So if you lose three, three plus acres of developable land, that's a sizable chunk to lose to help offset those costs. So uh, for all intents and purposes, whatever, whatever numbers, six million plus for the cost of infrastructure, 100% of that would be cost, would be covered through bond, the sale of bonds. Correct. Um, building on that, um, where does the risk, uh, who, who holds the risk or who assumes the risk uh, to, to, be, to guarantee the service of this debt? Right. Um, under, under the bond documents and under state statute, the district alone would be responsible to service those bonds. Now, and the secondary layer is the risk profile for those bonds is 100% with the bondholder. The district, when we issue the bonds, would make a pledge and say, we will impose X mills of property tax on this property. And so long as we do that faithfully every year, that is, that is the only obligation of the district. If that property tax revenue isn't sufficient to meet the bond payments, the risk of any shortfall is on the bondholder. Uh, good, uh, those are my questions on finance. I have two other questions. One, just on terms of governance. I was a little confused because um, it makes reference to the city council or the municipality um, uh, appointing council members or uh, directors. Uh, and then I see the names of the directors recommended for this. So maybe this is a Carolyn question. Is this a two-step that based that, that we make an appointment, we make an appointment based on their recommendations if we want to. Uh, we, could, we could choose to approve or not approve any of their recommendations or appoint someone else. And then they serve until they're elected and the only electors in that case would be them. Is that the, is that the way it goes? Um, I agree with the characterization of the two-step process, right? They can't hold an election yet because they're not formed yet as a district. So you have to appoint them in the interim until the district becomes formed and then they can hold an election at the appropriate time and then those persons can stand for election. Um, you could, in theory, appoint other persons than those who have been recommended, but they have to be qualified under yeah. the statutory requirements. And given the requirement that they be um, owners of businesses or property within the district, there probably aren't any other persons who are qualified that you could appoint. Uh, so that is the so my understanding of the two-step two process is, is the way it's going to play out. Yes. And our action, if we approve this ordinance, would basically be to appoint those people recommended in the application. That's right. Last question. Um, 
I didn't see anywhere in the application, and maybe because it's, it's just not even an option, that directors are compensated. Are, are, the, are the, those who serve on the, on the board of directors of a business improvement district, are they compensated? I need to look up to confirm that. Maybe Russ knows off the top of his head. I believe the only compensation they can receive has to do with certain per diem and expense costs. They cannot receive, you know, salary type compensation. That, that's correct. Uh, they, they can receive a per diem per state statute. The, the BID statute isn't express on that. Um, we represent 43 BIDs. Every one of them follows the Title 32 requirement that it's $100 per diem per meeting up to a maximum of 24 meetings a year, and that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have a motion pertaining to Ordinance 2020-38? Uh, I would move Ordinance 2020-38. I'll second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. All right. The ordinance carries six to one with Councilmember Christensen opposed. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dykstra. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to 2021 budget presentation. Mr. Golden. Here, this is this may be a a more lengthy presentation. Do you all want to take a quick break? Oh, what is lengthy? At least I mean, 90 minutes. At least, yeah. An hour and a half? At least. Oh, wow. All right, let's take a five minute break. We'll come back. <laughs> Thanks.
One, two, three, four, five. There she is. All right, Jim, go ahead and start this movie. All right, Mayor Bagley, members of the council, Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. So this is the first of our 2021 budget presentations this evening. Uh, we, we're going to start off with a, a budget tutorial. Uh, Teresa Malloy was going to make that presentation. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to be with us this evening. So we're going to defer that to next week. But we'll start then with um, the compensation plan. And Joanne Zias, the Chief Human Resources Officer, is going to make that presentation. If uh, Steffi can get us that first PowerPoint on the compensation plan, that would be great. Uh, Jim, that's going to be me on okay, the first presentation. That's okay. So, good evening, Mayor, members of Council, Joanne Zias, Chief Human Resources Officer. I would like to take a few minutes tonight just to speak to you about employee compensation and our budget recommendations in light of the current labor market outlook. As you're aware, this is a very volatile time for economic projections. Our compensation recommendations are made with affordability in mind and also a look towards flexibility as we're able to obtain additional information as we move into 2021. Uh, next slide, Susan. So the first thing that I'd like to um, take a look at is just in terms of the market itself, where we're at with turnover, I, I apologize, where we're at with um, unemployment data. And so the data that we have right now is from August 21st. It is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It does not match because the Bureau of Labor Statistics will uh, report Colorado as a state before it will report the counties. So the data that you're looking at there for Colorado is July data. The data that you're looking at there for June is the counties um, because they do lag behind. Because of them lagging behind and because of the volatility we have right now, those numbers look higher in the counties. I do suspect that when we get those numbers in for July, that those will start to even out for the counties. The reason that those uh, counties are specified is because that is what the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates. I cannot unfortunately get one specifically for Longmont. I also cannot get one uh, that incorporates Weld County. So we're dealing with the data that they're able to provide to us. Next slide. As you'll probably be hearing throughout all of these budget comp um, presentations, compensation is no different in this environment. It is an uncertain environment. We do typically create compensation plans from projections. Those projections are done towards the end of each year and they come in towards the beginning of the following year. We did get those uh, at the beginning of 2020. However, we received them in February and the individuals that completed them completed them at the end of 2019. As we started to get information from the survey respondents, what we were seeing, especially in other cities, is that what they provided at the end of 2019 may no longer be valid. So we did not want to use those surveys today to create a compensation plan because we just were not sure if they were valid. So rather than do that, we um, continue to use the benchmarks that we have in place currently. And then we want to be able to take a look as the market changes and make adjustments as we feel that they're stabilizing. We do have a little bit of information uh, that is a uh, most recent survey. Uh, the Society for Human Resource Management has a projection on August 17th where they were saying that they're expecting about a 1.9% range increase across employers and a 3% wage growth for existing employees. It's a good starting point benchmark. It is a national benchmark and it is not specific to government. So it, 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 I guess the beginning of a start, but not something that we feel that we're able to rely on at this point. What we do believe is that uh, in the fall of 2020, we will start to get survey updates. Those are gonna be a little bit more aggregate. So we will see things like Colorado Municipal League pr provide information as a whole, similar to that Society for Human Resource Management. And then going forward, we will start to get surveys in early 2021 that will, just like last year, start to incorporate the end of 2020. Next slide, please. Turnover, I wanted to give a little bit of information. Even though the market has a pretty high unemployment rate, we do have a relatively low turnover rate within the city. 
it is still something we want to monitor and we want to make sure that we're caring for. We are remaining steady with the turnover. We're seeing a pretty consistent number from what I've seen in prior years as well. So we're running at 8.74%. And when we're looking at the beginning half of 2020, that's running at 5.8%. So year to date. We do also want to monitor retirements. We did have, we have about a 20 per year. Again, those are remaining on track. We have a large percentage of employees that are currently or soon eligible for retirement. So even though they're not a large percentage of our turnover still, we do expect that we're going to have additional employees that we need to make sure that we're monitoring and that we're tracking for plans. And the next slide, we'll go into a little bit of detail on that if we pull that up. So this is our projection for retirement eligibility. It's a little bit small, but what it's showing is that we have over the next two years, we will have about 264 of our employees or about a quarter of our employees who are eligible to retire. So there is a little bit of a high unemployment rate at this point we, that may or may not stabilize a little bit more. We still have a pretty significant um, need to make sure that we're being competitive, that we're retaining individuals as long as they're willing to work for us, and also that we're able to be competitive when we need to fill those um, positions. Next slide, please. Many of you have probably seen this slide before. Um, this is our compensation philosophy, and so this is what we're working towards. And what we always say is that we want to provide prevailing market rates we do know that we need to be a value proposition for our taxpayers. We also know that we have pretty strong efficiencies. And what we see is that our staffing is matching other cities, but our value is that we are providing many more services than most of those cities are. So we see that we have pretty strong efficiencies. We wanna make sure that we're asking our employees to do more with less, that we are compensating them for that and we're retaining them. Currently, what we're doing is benchmarking our salaries to 101%. Um, we have had a goal for a few years now to move to 102% as funding levels allow. In this budget, we are not looking to move, but we are looking to retain that 101% that we've already established. Next slide, please. So essentially for 2021 to start, we are not making any market adjustment for employees. We're just looking to keep those salary ranges where they are. We have made some space in the budget to move employees who were under their market salary towards that market salary. So if they're below that rate, they can move towards it. But the rate itself is not changing. We also have looked to budget um, for our exceptional pay process. And so that process, employees are nominated for that. If the 21 budget would allow in the future going forward, then we would be prepared at that point with some market data that we feel like we can rely on so that we can evaluate it and make some additional recommendations for adjustments. Next slide, please. This is just a little bit of additional detail on that exceptional pay program. Essentially what that program is set up for is to reward employees who are going above and beyond their regular performance. So it's not just doing your job, it's doing something that's making a significant contribution to the organization. We have that budgeted at 2% of salary. And what happens with that program is that nominations are evaluated by the department director. They're nominated. They go through a review process with Harold and myself. Next slide, please. Joanne, I popped out of that. Hang on just a second. Sure. <clears throat> and you saw the thank you so when you, you know this part's almost done <laughs> um just a little bit of notes in terms of uh, the future compensation direct direction what we're hoping is that as we have the ability that we will go ahead and start to move towards that pay target i don't know that that's going to happen in the near future but we do want to keep that on there as a goal it's been something that has been a goal we also want to allow for that range movement within our step positions we want to make sure that we're continuing to refine our data sources. And if we do need to, if the economy stabilizes and 2021 revenue exceeds projections, if we're, we're hitting that point where we really want to be able to make that change and we're able to make that change, then we want to be ready to move. Um, so those are our goals going forward. 
Next slide, please. And that is just some basic information on where we're headed with compensation. Oh. Happy to answer any questions. Fit. All right, Already. let's move on. I don't see any okay. questions. All right, we're going to move on to pensions and health benefits. Susan, if you could put up that PowerPoint, appreciate that. We did include info in the budget message on these topics. So these brief presentations are really meant to complement uh, or supplement the info that were, was in the budget message. So the next slide, please. Next slide, Susan. Uh, Steph's gonna try and run this one. Oh, okay. Um, Steph, can you put it into presentation mode? It should be the icon at the bottom near your Zoom. Do you see that? Hey, Susan, can you just go with it? I'm on it. All right, Steph, so can you cancel I'll... out of that? Thank you. I'm going to begin uh, talking about the old higher pension plans. Um, so the mayor and the mayor pro tem are both on the old higher pension boards. Um, the, those are defined benefit plans and they have an annual actuarial um, review performed, performed on them each year. I uh, included a copy of the PowerPoint that we received from the actuary just last month. We get those uh, reports in August of each year. And that was included uh, for each of the defined benefit plans included in your packet uh, for your information uh, purposes. The actuary reports themselves are also available off the finance webpage. Just want to make sure that all the council is able to access the same level of information as the board members. Um, so um, each of these two old hire plans, they're only down to eight members each. Um, the old hire police plan has an unfunded liability of the share of $145,197. It's 89.3% funded. So we have included the required actuarial contribution of $23,174 in the uh, 2021 proposed budget that'll amortize the liability of the police plan uh, over the remaining um, expected life for the participants. The old fire, old higher fire plan actually has a surplus. It has a negative unfunded liability of over $400,000. So it's 116% funded. So there is no contribution requirement for that plan. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk about the general employees retirement plan. And uh, it's also a defined benefit plan. Uh, the uh, GERP plan is, has been, has had a history traditionally of being fully funded until 2008. Uh, the benefit increases uh, are not able to be built into this plan under Tabor unless the plan were to reach fully funded status, which again, it had been all the way through 2008. And then when we had the economic downturn, this plan did take a, a quite a drop in its funding level. And we've been working on trying to get it back to a fully funded status. So we've been trying to be more aggressive about that in recent years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in, first of all, in, in 2011, in response to um, that downturn uh, and be trying to get back to fully funded status, we did make changes uh, to the plan and to the benefits in the plan. Uh, we created uh, a new tier of employee participants. So anyone that was hired prior to 2011 is considered a tier one employee. Uh, 2012 afterwards are tier two employees and their early retirement benefits are different from what they are for the employees that were hired prior to 2012. Uh, that was again an attempt to try to, to reduce costs. Uh, at the same time what we did is we, we have a lower contribution level for 
tier two employees since they're not getting the, not the same level of benefit. In 2016, the GERP board made a change to our funding policy to amortize the liability over a closed 30 year period. So it was previously over an open period, which continued to revolve. So under a closed period, we have a target. We move towards that target to reach fully funded over that 30 years. A uh, long period of time, significant period of time, but we are, we are making progress towards that. Next slide, please. So the period will be 26 years from January 1st, 2019. So another 25 years or so to go before it would reach that status under the current uh, required contribution scenarios. Um, gains and losses are, are smooth. Uh, on an actuarial basis. So what the actuary does is when there's when it's gains or losses from our investments, they figure them in, out so that the impact is smoothed over five years so that we don't have a volatile contribution requirement. So in 2019, our performance was strong. strong. We had over a 19% actuarial return on our investments. So in 2020, our report gave us uh, uh, reported an unfunded liability for the GERP of 22.6 million and uh, making it 87.9% funded. So we lost a little bit of ground because we had a uh, unfunded liability the year before of 20.1 million and 88.6% funding. Next slide. Um, so in the budget message, we. Um, We've laid out all the detail on the history of the contributions to this plan and how it's grown over time. Um, we are recommending that in this budget that the contribution, well, actually the actuarial recommendation here is that the contribution uh, requirement is going from 13.9% to 14.2% of compensation. So in this next, in the, uh, the next bullet here is incorrect. It's proposed 2021 budget is including an increase in the city's contribution requirement. It's going from 8% to 8.4%. Um, explain the tier one and tier two employees. Uh, currently, a tier one employee has a 6% contribution requirement. Tier two employees are always 1% below the tier one employee contribution requirement. So they have a 5% contribution requirement really wouldn't put a focus on this actual blended percentage in the past. And this year we are looking at that closer. So that it's a 5.4% blend on this contribution requirement for employees currently. It's about what it generates um, when you mix in tier one to tier two employees. Next slide, please. So what the contributions for 2021 are proposed as 8.4% city and adding that to the 5.4% employee, it's uh, below the total required contribution of 14.2%. And normally we would recommend an increase in employee contributions because of the fact that there's no increase in, uh, in the pay plan this year. We shied away from doing that in, in this year's budget uh, to defer that till uh, hopefully next year. Uh, in the meantime, um, what we are uh, recommending uh, since you have to understand these actuary studies, we get them in August. It's telling us what we should be contributing in, throughout 2020. So it's really coming in arrears and a little bit too late for us to react uh, from a budgetary level. So we have had to uh, make adjustments on the fly. Last year, when I talked to the council at this point in time about the, the GERP plan, I made a recommendation that we make up for uh, the shortfall in contribution below the requirement by um, transferring $400,000 from the health benefit fund. It's a practice that we did um, after the downturn in 2008, when we had a very large increase to our contribution requirement. So we rec recommended it again last year, along with we had increased employee contributions from 5.8% to 6% for 2020. So after I made those recommendations to y'all, and I think the council accepted those at that time, I got busy and did everything else, and I never brought them back to you for action. So what you will see in the coming weeks 
is that we will still need to make that 400,000 contribution that we intended to make last year. And we're recommending right here that we make another 400,000 contribution for 2020 for the deficit that we are uh, currently experiencing in our contributions being below the actuarial estimate. And then for 2021, it would be another $200,000 to close that gap again. So all of that would be coming from the health benefit fund, which I'll be talking about in uh, uh, starting in a couple of seconds here. Um, so that's uh, pretty much would get us back on track to being able to meet those contrib uh, actual contribution requirements in the long run. So hopefully with uh, pay increases next year that, um, and plus also hopefully better returns on our investments, we'll be able to narrow those gaps as we move forward. Next slide, please. So now the health benefit funds. Um, so uh, the, the council com communication does have some information on it that is uh, explaining how we budget for employee benefits each year for the health benefit fund. The health benefit fund is, is a pooled fund it's an internal service fund where we take contributions from or from throughout the organization from the operating funds. We take employee contributions towards premiums, and this is where we pay for our premiums for health insurance as well as uh, dental, life, and EAP. So, in addition to that, we uh, these are smaller amounts compared to those, but we also incl include these additional uh, benefits that are shown here on this slide, wellness costs, police and fire physicals. And then as I just was referring to, this is the 2021 budget recommendations. So this has $200,000 for the GERP um, actuarial liability. And then uh, the health benefit fund fund balance is projected to end 2020 at a balance of over $9.38 million. Uh, our projections for the uh, 2021 are that it's going to pretty much re remain stable and, and maintain that level of balance. Uh, as part of the council communication, there's an attachment C in there that is the pro forma that's showing you uh, three years of the health benefit fund. Uh, the 2019 actual, our projections for 2020 and what we're budgeting for 21. Next slide, please. So uh, in the 2021 proposed budget, our health benefits are based on a negotiated cost with Kaiser of a 7.11% increase for 21. Um, since 2007, our Kaiser costs have averaged an aggregated blend premium increase of 4.51%. And that's compared to industry averages here in this this isn't uh, very current, but it's probably seven to 11% or higher at this point in time. So we have no increase in any other premiums from any of the insurances that are coming from the, the health benefit fund this year, because we had uh, negotiated two year deals uh, last year on each of the other ones. So for 2021, the only increase is coming for our health benefits. So we were able to, um, to maintain the health benefit fund contributions from the uh, different operating funds at 16 and a half percent of salary, which is, this will be the third straight year that we're able to uh, keep that at 16.5%. Any questions on pension or health benefits? Dr. Waters. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, just to clarify, uh, the individual contributions to the, uh, to the, uh, retirement program, I think it's the retirement program, um, that I understand in the presentation, uh, the individual contribution, and maybe this is, maybe I need to sort, this is, maybe this is the health fund, from 5.8% to 6%. We'll go back to that slide. Um. Yes, Susan, maybe if you can go back while, while you are, I'll, um, that, that's correct. Uh, the um, contributions went 
from 5.8% to 6% for 2020. For the retirement so, program. For the, for, for the GERP plan, that's correct. That's retirement um, plan. So if I, if I think about um, the earlier presentation about compensation, we're gonna maintain, the proposal is to maintain salary ranges in 2021 where they are in 2020. Um, people on, who, are on, who are still moving through their salary ranges would get whatever that step increase is. Uh, people at the top of their ranges would be frozen. Is that fair? Uh, most uh, individuals in the open range who are at a market or above probably would be, be uh, frozen where they're at. Those that are below market would be, uh, have an opportunity to move upwards as high as 5%. STEP employees, actually, police and fire are not in the GERP plan, and we only have okay. a few, few ex STEP employees in the GERP plan in the, <clears throat> in the electric department. So, um, so my question specifically, I'm sorry, Harold, were you going to weigh in? Well, yeah, so I want to, to kind of be clear on that one. So in terms of STEP plans, we have police, fire, and then the LPC uh, line, line positions. Um, they're in steps, and then the majority of our other staff are in the um, open range positions. And so if they're behind the 2020 market, correct, Jim? Or is it the 2019 market? I'm going to make sure I It'd say it. It'd be the 2020 right. market. If they're behind the 2020 market, they can move up as much as 5%. But if you're at market, you're frozen. Yeah. So if for those employees who are at market, and I don't know what percentage that represents. <clears throat> For all intents and purposes, is it fair to say that their 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 uh, salary would be reduced by 0.2 percent because of the additional contribution uh, no. to the to the retirement plan? No, actually. So uh, the the 5.8 to 6 percent took place at the beginning of 2020. We did institute it for our employees. That was in this year. Right. I just need to bring it back to the council to make that amendment in the plan, but we did institute it. So it is a 6%. So it's exactly why we're not increasing it beyond 6% this year is for the reason that you're bringing up. All right. Because I, because this is the question I should have asked last year as we were going through this, because it, because it does have this differential effect, right? For folks who are at the top, but, right. but it's, but I'm a year late with my question. <laughs> but I, but I get the sense. I appreciate the sensitivity to it, and and, and I appreciate the, appreciate the explanation because you knew where I was going. So okay, thanks. you bet. Can I, can I, can I, can I, before we leave this, can I ask one more thing? You bet. Sure. Um, and I should have asked it when Joanne did her presentation, and I was slow on the draw with uh, my hand up. Um, you know, the table. This is less about what we just heard from Jim than than um, what we should be anticipating in terms of. Uh, turnover just through retirements, uh, without without getting uh, into individual uh, information that we shouldn't have access to, is there some way for us to get an idea beyond that uh, table, Joanne, that you laid out? Uh, what should we should be anticipating at least at the senior level in terms of projected or anticipated retirement dates? So I, I think it's a little bit of a challenge to answer, only because sometimes you you could you know, look at an individual and they could be totally ready from an age perspective and they decide to stay longer. It tends to be a pretty individual decision. Um, having said that though, I know a number of our um, senior leaders are, are pretty um, open with their supervisors. So I, I have seen a decent amount of time for planning in most cases. Um, I haven't seen anybody from the senior leadership, you know, just, just take, you know, just leave quickly. Well, I have no doubt. Yeah. Because we, because I've heard from you enough, I have no doubt that you and Harold and and our senior staff um, have pretty pretty good succession plans in place. It's a constant conversation, I'm sure. But I, it would be, to, however, whatever level of detail you could share, so that we have some idea of what Cal, this or some future council should be anticipating would be helpful. Just because there's a, so many decisions we make that potentially influence the decisions they make. Right. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I just like to would be mindful of what I might be doing on a Tuesday night that contributes to an accelerated de decision by one of our senior staff members. Um, so, 
Anyway, yeah, if I can jump in and answer that question. So um, specifically as it relates to the senior staff in the group that I meet with, um, succession planning has been a significant topic of conversation amongst all of us. Um, there are um, a significant number that are eligible within the next year or two. Um, and so that has, has been a, a significant focus on my, of mine. Um, and, and you've seen some of this. So, you, you know, you all have seen Tom Romeos, who is eligible, Mike Butler, who is eligible. That is something that it, that we have to work on and, and we have to be cognizant of because they're, and it's not just at that senior staff level. It is, it is also the level before below them where we have a lot of folks that have been here, you know, for a significant period of time. And um, as you've heard me talk about this, this is an issue coming at us and we're working to really work with staff on that succession planning. That's part of the structure that you're seeing us build um, as, as we're bringing things together so we can have multiple people digging into it. Part of where you're seeing me move to place some attention so that I can understand succession plans. So it is going to be an issue for us um, in, the, in, the, in the next few years. Um, kind of tell you what's also happening with my, within our industry in general. I think the things that we're concerned about is um, that ongoing backfill, uh, because we are hearing that there's fewer and few, fewer people who want to get into this line of work. So there's really two things coming at us right now. And, um, and I know that, you know, just my alumni association, you know, recruiting people to get an MPA or these types of things, they're reaching out to us based on what we're seeing. So multiple issues in play for us right now, um, succession planning, recruitment or retention, also then looking at recruitment and how, how you build that pipeline as well. So you're telling me that people aren't just lining up in, in droves to go to work for <laughs> cities and work for councils and, and all the public scrutiny and pressure you all live with every day? Gee, what a surprise, huh? Thanks. All right, Jim, keep going, please. All right, we're going to move into the CIP presentation now. Susan, if you could put up that PowerPoint. I'll start to uh, make some comments to introduce it. So the CIP, um, it's a planning document that shows all the infrastructure needs of the city over the next five years. Uh, it's a collection of capital projects, basically. Um, they're either new or replacements of or improvements to infrastructure that has a minimum life expectancy of five years and a minimum cost of at least $10,000. Uh, next slide. So our 21 to 25 proposed CIP is a total of 200 and almost $244 million over five years. Uh, only the first year, 2021, will actually be appropriated, although the council does act to adopt the whole CIP. The other four years re represent plans, uh, but the projects are considered to be funded. Uh, this slide shows the uh, breakdown of the $244 million by category. So next slide, please. This here is showing the amount of the funded CIP projects uh, by year. And then uh, the next slide, please. So this is the breakdown of 2021, the first year of the CIP. And this is also by project category. So the individual projects, they're included in the CIP document on pages 11 and 12. And then there's individual pages for each and every one of those projects, but 11 and 12 does break down each of the projects that are in uh, each of these nine or so categories on the left side of the slide. Um, so the, there's where you can get more detailed information on that. We're going to be making uh, some presentations tonight on, on projects for, uh, uh, for both um, 2021 as well as some that are already in, in process. Um, and then, and also I should point out that within the CIP on pages 14 to 16, you get all five years of projects are all listed in there as well. So with that, the next slide is a cover slide that is uh, showing you the staff that will be involved in making the presentation to you this evening. Uh, I'm going to turn this next over to Jeff Friesner 
to pick it up from the next slide forward. One more slide, slide please, uh, Susan. Thank you, Mayor, members of council, Jeff Friesner, Recreation and Golf Manager. I'm here to highlight four of the projects for the Community Services Department. First project is improvements at the Callahan House. If uh, you look at the picture on that slide, we are uh, at the bottom, the, the windows are made of Lexon and uh, we're looking at replacing that because they're all uh, fogged over and difficult to see. And then we're also gonna replace or install storm windows. Uh, the, the second item that we are proposing is repair of the decorative uh, lead window that you see at the top of that, uh, uh, of that picture. Um, our issue is that the, uh, over time that uh, shifting of the building is uh, starting to push that uh, window uh, out and we want to make sure that that could be protected as a part of the historic house. The third item would be repair to the driveway that has cracking and is breaking up and is becoming a safety issue. Next slide. Next uh, project is the uh, Firehouse Arts Center facility improvements. As you're aware, this is a city owned uh, facility on 4th uh, that the Firehouse Arts uh, uh, Center uses. Um, it's been a while since uh, any work has really been done on that uh, facility. Uh, we are proposing uh, two years of repairs with the first year being uh, painting replacement, uh, painting of windows or replacement of windows and also some work on the gutters that uh, is causing some interior damage and then replacement of the basement stairs and handrail. Uh, a total of uh, $60,600. Next slide. The next uh, project is the museum entry uh, concrete replacement. Uh, anyone that has gone to the museum has noticed how the uh, concrete is coming apart and is causing a safety issue. Staff has tried to do a number of uh, improvements to make that uh, better, but those uh, improvements are failing also. You can see in that uh, picture on the right, some of the uh, temporary concrete that's uh, been put in there. A uh, total of $101,000 for that project. Next slide. Uh, the next uh, project is replacement of the concrete at the Roosevelt Pavilion. Uh, uh, in 2017, the post-tension cables started to fail and caused a large uh, damage to some of the concrete. At that time, uh, the engineering staff uh, worked to figure out how we could cut the cables in that concrete to prevent it from uh, damaging more concrete and, and worse, hurt, possibly hurting someone. Uh, this project proposes that we spend $40,000 for design in 2021 and uh, another 229,000 to do the actual concrete replacement. One of the challenges in this is that there are cables still in there that are required to help hold up the, the pavilion itself. So it will take some engineering to uh, get that done right and without damaging the <coughs> pavilion. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jim Angstad. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, City Council members. Uh, Jim Angstad with Public Works and Natural Resources. Hey, Jim, hold on one second. Dr. Waters, did you have a question for Jim? No, I had a question for Jeff. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to track as Jeff goes through his, his presentation the projects he referenced, and I, if I'm looking on the, if I were to use pages 14, 15, and 16 um, in the CIP budget, um, I see one of those referenced, I think, the Roosevelt Park improvement, no. Uh, the Roosevelt Pavilion concrete replacement. But I don't see reference to the firehouse, 
project or to the camera handles? Where, where should I be looking, Jeff? You know, I, I don't have that document. Jim Golden, can you help with that? So um, I would look on page 11 and 12. And at the bottom of page 11 is the, um, is the Callahan house improvements that you're asking about. Would Jim, Jim, just so, just shouldn't, wouldn't I find these if I kind of I wanted to look at them in the context of the five-year plan, wouldn't I see the same projects listed in 21 and yeah, 21 uh, as funded as as I would see on pages 11 and 12 here? Okay, um, yeah. So it's on page 15 in that display. It's on page 15 under public buildings and facilities. Oh, it's public buildings. Too. I see. Okay, I was looking for parks under parks and rec. Now I see it. I got it. Okay, thanks. Got it. You bet. Thank you. So, Mayor Bagley, City Council members, Jim Angstadt with Public Works and Natural Resources. The uh, last two projects we wanted to cover under the uh, municipal buildings. Um, PBF uh, 119 is uh, municipal buildings flooring replacement, bringing in a project budget of about $270,000, uh, replacing uh, flooring and carpeting at four buildings. Uh, the industry standard for carpeting and, and flooring replacement is about 12, anywhere between 12 and 15 years. Uh, two of these buildings fall within those, uh, those numbers. Uh, two of them are well beyond it. Uh, so it is time to, to replace those. Could you go to the next slide, please? So early in, in 2020, uh, city staff completed a building envelope energy audit report uh, that recommended several improvements to building envelopes at the four buildings listed here uh, to improve energy use, reduce greenhouse gases and support environmental stewardship. Uh, the project budget is about $200,000. Uh, we'll be uh, undertaking that next year. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over. Uh... Hey, Jim, before you go into that, just oh, so council knows, um, when we were reviewing the issues in the public, uh, in the public, when we were reviewing the public improvement fund and public buildings, just so council knows, one of the things that I was looking at, um, and we really saw this when we got into the massive project at the Civic Center and what we're doing now in front of the library is, and, and you see this in, in all of these, um, is really a focus on maintenance. Um, and, and as we've talked about with council before, uh, before we look at some of the new things, we really need to make sure that what we already have in our existing inventory is well maintained um, so that we can work to add life expectancy to it and we can minimize uh, the situation that we've gotten into with some of our other facilities. So I just wanted you to know what I was thinking about in terms of how we were moving through these projects and then obviously the public buildings efficiency improvements ties to the work that they did when they were evaluating it, but also ties to the sustainability plan that council passed. And then the work that we've done in conjunction with the climate action task force. So we, we thought we could bring those three things together. I see another question. Mr. Waters. Yeah, sorry. I don't mean, I don't mean to bog it down. Um, I, I, this is maybe for Jim, maybe for Harold. As, I, as I'm looking at, again, I'm on page 15, as I'm looking at that list of 2021 and then to 25. And I see that in, 20, in 2020, uh, the Civic Center Rehab, the Library, Facilities Condition Assessments, and that uh, combination of probably 13, maybe $12 million, that, that's highlighted that way because that came from the bond uh, question that was approved. Correct. Um, uh, the other projects, the firehouse upgrades and the golf course uh, maintenance facility, um, I, don't, I don't, did I see that in like in Parks and Rec uh, or in, in, where would, in public safety or, or is the, where would I see the firehouse station improvements? Um, we, we are creating a new one, we're rehabbing one. Where, where, are the, where are those showing up in terms of the bond funding for those projects? Look in. Should. 
and for and for like the golf, the sprinkling, the watering systems, and the in the uh, in the in the maintenance facility that was all part of that project, uh, that, uh, part of that bond. That will be on. presented later in the presentation. No, but the question is, where are they on on slide? on page 15. Let, let me check that out, Councilman Waters, and, and I'll answer the question. Yeah, or would, whatever page. <laughs> let, let, yeah, let's move on in the meantime right. and I'll find that. So with that, we'll, um, the next part of our presentation involves uh, Longmont Power and Communications. So I'm gonna turn it over to David Hornbacher, who's gonna tell us how he's gonna keep the lights on. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And Tonight's a little bit more challenging than, than some nights with that wet, heavy snow and the uh, trees still leafed out. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. I'm Dave Hornbacher, the Executive Director for Longmont Power and Communications. I'm gonna highlight just a few of our CIP programs here uh, in 2021 and beyond. So next slide, please. So you can see with the 2021 overview, it's approximately 11.2 million. Uh, there are multiple projects in there. There are two of more size. One is the eight construction for 4.1 million. And as council may recall, they've seen that annually. And what that is, is the money that is attributed to the extension and modification of electric system to uh, serve the development within the community. And likewise, we recover that money for those services. Uh, also, the advanced metering infrastructure at $6 million for 2021, and I'll cover that in greater detail in a future slide. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the, one of the um, activities is the electric system, up, uh, the electric substation upgrades, and $200,000 for this year and four hundred fifteen dollars over the next coming years. It basically has some additional technology on the system some landscaping, and I'm very happy to say, if you look at that bottom right photo, that is an aerial shot of our county line uh, substation. And you'll notice two buildings and to the right of one building, there's a, a dark object there, that's transformer number one. And immediately south of that, right now, we're finishing up transformer number two. That will be online within uh, this fall. So within the next 30 to 60 days we'll actually have additional capacity at that substation. So we do need to finish up the landscaping, landscaping and gate. Uh, next photo, please, or next. Thank you. Um, I group these together because realistically, these are a trio of projects that work together and they're very integral to part of our uh, goal, our this decade's goal of 100% renewable energy. So it's the reliability, the modernization of the grid, it's uh, rehab and improvements, and it's distributed energy resources. And distributed energy resources is a new capital line item, and that's covering a variety of specific subject topics, but that includes distributed generation, distributed energy storage, energy efficiency, demand response, and beneficial electrification. Those are sort of key components of uh, distributed energy resources, you'll see it in slang as DERS, and I'll go into that in a little bit more, but it's one of the keys to getting to uh, our, our goal at the end of this decade. Next slide, please. And so advanced metering. So this is a multi-year project. Uh, council actually last year uh, approved uh, the rate changes to support this project. And so this project is one that we're looking to fund directly uh, from the utility. We are not going out and seeking bonding or other uh, resources for it. You can see that there's uh, 7.5 million in 2021. Uh, five years uh, total is 13.5. And I think some of, the, some of the updates on the AMI project is we are in the process of hiring an AMI project manager to lead this transition in our metering, uh, as well as then the ramp out to that for use with our customers. Uh, we've also been reviewing other utility contracts specific to AMI projects that have been done in the last year or two to make sure that we're well informed and we know our pricing. We've also worked on extensive functionality. And what I would anticipate is that the selection of the system will be done in 2020 
and then uh, installations will occur in 2021 and 2022 based on the final vendor and uh, the ability to integrate that into our community. And probably more specifically, when we talked about AMI, we, we noted that our current technology is, is basically one, one read of a meter a month by a person walking by it and that that does not really support the needs of the future. And back when I mentioned the TRIO projects, it's between those TRIO projects and AMI, they're sort of the basis of building essentially the utility of the future today. And it's one of the, AMI is one of those enabling technologies to help us get there. And more specifically, it, um, it creates this connection between energy use and energy generation. And that cannot occur with the current system. And then when customers can actually understand and start to manage their energy use, that gets us much closer to being able to start to match their energy use with the flexibility and the dynamics that you see with renewable energy. It also allows to integrate or support smart home functions. So as customers become even more enabled and more interested in understanding and managing their energy on a very, you know, appliance by appliance basis, it's something that can help support that. I also had mentioned earlier the DERS, the Distributed Energy Resources. And again, you have to have the data coming in so you know to what degree and where energy is being generated, how it comes onto your system and how you can utilize it. Uh, likewise, as we move into storage, uh, you know, distributed energy storage, again, how can you leverage that to uh, fill the, the valleys where other resources are not available? Again, it supports energy efficiency, demand response, and beneficial electrification. And we have heard at the last several council meetings, a public invited to heard, that there is an express concern with uh, the radio frequency from AMI meters. I think the key is, is be assured that we take their concerns seriously. We listen, and while we're not the medical experts on this, we do refer and rely on the expertise of other agencies that we trust, such as the CDC, the FCC, uh, and as well as the Colorado Department of Public Health to help guide and inform us as we move forward with this project. Next slide, please. Uh, another one that we have in there is electric vehicle charging stations. We have several charging stations available out there to the public. Uh, we recently completed one at the library. We have um, another one out at the museum and serving sort of the museum and, and the uh, facilities out there. And then also another one at the service center. Uh, we want to push further into electrical vehicle charging, both for city vehicles um, as well as community vehicles. And that's what this funding is for, is to provide more of those stations in the public eye and to really get good at this as we start to see more and more electrical vehicles become a substantial mode of transportation. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, I would turn it over to Valerie Dodd. Any questions on the electric piece from council? Dr. Waters. Yeah, um, Harold, this is no surprise to you. I, I, and I've expressed myself to the council on this. Um, David, I appreciate uh, your reference to, the, to what we've heard from the public. Um, I, I think there are two issues for me that we've heard. One are the health issues and, I, and the other is um, uh, whether which which approach wired or wireless is more future oriented um, uh, and has greater potential down the road. I know, and I don't know enough about either of those topics to have formed a, a, a meaningful conclusion or or set of observations um, or decisions. But if we're gonna, if, if we're, and I think we should continue with our smart metering system. No question about that. It's critical to achieving our our 100% renewable energy by 2030 goal, but I, but I, for one, before I vote on a $13 million commitment, would like more information comparing the wireless and the wired systems in terms of efficiency and functionality and costs before we even talk about health issues 
um, uh, as we go forward with this with this approach. Not to question moving forward with AMI or smart metering, but but being clearer, at least for me, and maybe I just need a one-on-one -on -one tutorial um, that helps me understand the differences, cost, benefits, pluses and minuses on a wired versus a wireless approach. So uh, certainly, uh, Council Member Waters, I could work and schedule some time with you to go over that information and uh, hopefully address your questions uh, before you vote on this. All right, is there, is there a reason why we wouldn't want to invite in? We've heard several references to somebody who is the author of this Emma paper, Dr. Uh, Sheckley. Is there a reason why we wouldn't want to bring uh, his voice and expertise into this conversation? So I think, I think it's important to get down to the basics of these systems and what they do or they don't do. Back to your, your question. And um, so with that, I think there are certainly a variety of experts out there that are in tune and can answer those questions. But where I would first start is ensure that we've got the right information and current literature towards you versus trying to start bringing in others uh, who have uh, their uh, well-honed perspectives on these. So, you know, I've, I've, read, the, I've read the report. Um, I'm actually trying to skim through it. So um, there is a section, and, and so at least the one report that folks are referencing uh, was um, published on the 26th of November in, in 2012. And so some things that we have to let me kind of back up and some things that we have to really hit uh, on this is a we have a goal of 2030 um, uh, to go 100% renewable so so that becomes an anchor point in terms of being able to achieve it um, when we when you when you go in and and look at the report they they talk about a number of things and I lost my page so I can't find it now but um, this piece. Give me a second. Um, there we go. Um, so it's been some it's been some time on on the health evidence and and in there I think they they recognize that there's been different studies and different components um, or different studies and all coming to different conclusions. Um, and one of the points was, um, why would you invest in this if there is the chance for health issues? Um, I think some, some other pieces, um, and he says, first of all, smart meters have failed to deliver smart grid benefits for fundamentally technical reasons. Uh, networks do not generally provide full two-way communications. C customer usage display was in most case stale data. Um, on the third-party website, on-site real-time display is not feasible using most meter backhaul networks and smart meters and their networks cannot or are ill-equipped to implement demand response load control strategies. I think what I can say is when we're talking about this, what we have to choose based on becoming 100% renewable is something that, that really can implement, and David, if I'm misspeaking, you jump in, but mm -hmm. can implement demand response and load control strategies because that really is a fundamental component of how you look at moving to that 100% renewable. Um, we are looking at a network that is two-way communication, correct, David? Uh, absolutely. And, and so when, when you start pulling all this together and then in the early part of that article, they talk about the fact that the infrastructure on the system isn't built for this. And so you see the other investments that we're putting in place in terms of that um, infrastructure in, in our trunk, I call it the trunk system, but in our system coming into it, that has to integrate with the AMI. So I think what we'll need to do is, is um, really dig into this and, and bring some of those points. And then if you go to the, to the last section, um, when he talks about um, the, the health components, he does reference um, and then there's questions about who owns the data, how it's communicated. Um, 
Yeah, and I think part of it is, is when you go to move into this world, you really want that two-way communication with the residents so they can help you manage your loads, especially as we've talked about, when you enter that world, you may have a glut of energy that you need to, to pull down on. Um, and then um, when you look at this, so for example, California, in this article, they passed and they said, uh, wireless smart meters when installed properly maintained result in smaller levels of radio frequency exposure. References the FCC standard, um, scientific studies have not identified uh, confirmed negative health effects um, and not enough is currently known about potential non-thermal impacts. And so when you, when you move through this, he recognizes that it, there is a difference. Um, and, and the point is, in, in, in the face of this, the unavoidable question arises, why invest in something with no potential for harm that would impact people? That's the crux of the argument, taking in the different scientific studies. So what we can do is work and really bring those studies in a way similar to what we did in terms of the 5G to provide that to council. Well, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I'm, I, I want not to be a distraction or an annoyance, which I probably am already in this process. Um, but on this particular topic with the, with the commitment we're making and, and, the, and the visibility of it and the expense of it, I, I'd like to make certain uh, that you've helped me get as clear on this as you have done on other the on the 5G issues with uh, with the telecommunications industry and where we stand with the FCC, et cetera. Okay. So if that's the intent, I'll appreciate yep. that. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Let's continue. Okay. I think it is my turn. So good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of council. Valerie Dodd, the executive director of NextLight. I have one slide and one slide only. Um, so if someone will please jump to it, um, I'll skip through that. And then I'm hoping to come back in the next few weeks so that I can provide a more thorough and broad overview of the operations. Um, Cause I think there've been some questions about what's going on with next slide. So in terms of the 2021 capital budget, we have about $3.7 million planned uh, to be spent. That does represent about a 29% year over year increase. Um, the good news is that's mostly made up of about $800,000 worth of one-time expenses. Uh, in subsequent years, you won't see the capital budget nearly as high as it will be next year. If you look to the far right-hand side and you see that table, or excuse me, that pie chart, you'll see that really our capital expenses fall into three categories. One is fiber construction to make sure that we keep up with the new builds in the community. The second is around reliability and capacity to make sure that we continue to have a superior product in the marketplace. And then lastly, installations for customers, mostly residential and some uh, commercial. So if you look back to the left side, the fiber construction, which I spoke about being the largest piece of the pie, we have about $1.4 million planned there. And that is uh, really to enable about 2,900 new premises, which are mostly greenfield MDU builds or MDUs, multi-dwelling uh, family units. We also have about 48 small properties that we have still not gotten to that we want to finish out. And that should complete our build of the brownfield or existing properties. Uh, average cost for the build on those type of premises is about $484. Next, we get into those one-time reliability and capacity enhancement expenses that I referenced. Uh, we have about $600,000 in routers to enable 100 gig uh, capacity for transport. The reason we need that is because uh, this year we're growing our customer base by about 9%. Uh, next year, we will grow it by another 6%. And since the first quarter of this year, we are seeing about a 15% increase in data consumption. So we've got to make sure we accommodate a growing customer base as well as a growing uh, data consumption. The next is we're spending about $225,000 for a new fiber hut. Uh, we're uh, beginning a phase seven, which is over on county line. That is to accommodate uh, some growth that we have and some growth that we're expecting. So more to come about that, but we're certainly making sure that we're future-proofing that part of town. And then lastly, we have the installations. And that is one of those success-based expenses, meaning if the customers don't sign up for service, we don't incur that expense. Um, so we still are planning to turn up about 3,200 new customers next year. That is gross. You have a thing called churn where your customer base does churn out at a 
clip of about 2% a month, which is really low for the industry, but we'll probably only net about 1,400 customers um, next year, but we have to accommodate and, and spend the money to install about 3,200. Uh, the weighted average cost for those installations is around $368. Um, that will decline over time as we eventually hope to get a drop, an aerial or buried drop to every single household and premise. And so it'll be really easy to activate those customers going forward and many customers can do self-installations themselves. And then lastly, we have the Boston Avenue Bridge Project. Not a bunch of money, but just wanted to make sure you all knew that we were aligned with the other departments in terms of growth and builds. So I will pause and see if there are any questions. Nope, let's keep going. Okay, Jeff Cedar is up next, I believe. Thank you. Actually, I'll take this one. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of council. My name is Sharice Montgomery, and it's my pleasure to be joining you tonight as staff. I'm actually one of the new senior project managers in the facilities maintenance service division. Next slide, please. We've got four uh, bond projects underway. Phase one of the Civic Center Rehabilitation Project was the stabilization of the finance parking garage, and that work is complete. The garage was opened at the beginning of the year. Phase two work includes improvements at the Admin East structure, the Admin East parking garage, which was recently opened, and the Library Plaza. I would have anticipated the library work um, would have been complete prior to the first snowfall, uh, but given today's weather, that um, definitely proved me wrong. Uh, we're still underway there. We do uh, plan to continue renovations to include work at the library. Initial investigations have begun at the Safety and Justice Center, as well as the Facility Conditions Assessment at the Longmont Rec Center. Next slide, please. Recreation actually has five bond projects. Um, first, the U Creek Golf Course Maintenance Facility Project has started. Studio Architecture has been selected as the uh, project's architect. The planning development review process for the conditional use site plan application is underway. And we had our first virtual neighborhood meeting held July 8th. Uh, the Twin Peaks and Sunset Golf Course Irrigation System consultant selection is anticipated to begin later this year. And unfortunately, the Centennial Pool renovation and the golf course irrigation, rehabilitation, and replacement projects um, are currently on hold. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce another project manager in our facilities group, Carrie Sheehan. Carrie? If we can go to the next side, slide, please, Susan. So, Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Carrie. Uh -huh. Hold on one second. I'm sorry, yep, Carrie. Sorry, um, that's okay. I, uh, Dr. Waters, did your hand go up before your image disappeared off my computer? I only, it did. only. It did. All right. Uh, first of all, I'll say, Sharice, nice to see you. I didn't know you were in this in this job. Uh, where, where in where in the materials do these projects? Where am I? Where should I be looking? Because I don't, I'm not finding them on my pages 14, 15, and 16. I'm guessing they're there. I'm just not seeing them. I think Jim was looking for that. Jim, did you find it? So, yeah, actually, so Council Member Waters, when you're looking at 14, 15, and 16, if you notice the title of those pages are 21 through 25 Capital Improvement Program funded projects. Yeah. The projects shown here are only those that are between 21 and 25. If they have a budget from a prior year in 20 or prior, that's what that 20 budget column is showing. These projects that, that we're going over now with the bond do not have new money budgeted between 21 and 25. A few of the bond projects do, and so they are shown there. They, they have dollars scheduled in years four and five of the CIP. So I think that is why you're not seeing these golf projects there and the fire stations. So um, so they're, 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 they're will be funded by Bond right. funds, but they're no, they're not currently yet part of the five-year CIP budget. 
they're already in that they were previously budgeted in a prior year and they do not have any new money being budgeted from 21 through 25 so they're not included here all right if they, all right. I, I, they had new money then they would be here thanks jim i just didn't see them in 2020 either that's part of my problem but we're only showing 2020 because those projects have money from coming in during 21 through 25. Anything that's shown in 2020 has new money coming in after it sometime in 21 through 25. All right, I, I can follow up individually with you if I have more questions, thanks. Okay, you bet. Okay, so I'm back on again. Carrie Sheehan, Senior Project Manager of Facilities and Maintenance Services. I am working with Scott, Assistant Chief Scott Snyder on the two fire station replacements. So of the approximate $9.3 million in bond funds, we've got $7.6 million allocated to the design build services and approximately 1.2 million went to station two's land and pre-development costs. The design build contract is expected to be signed in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we plan on building both of the stations concurrently with construction scheduled to start at the end of Q1 2021. And we're anticipating completion of both stations in May of 2022. So that is all I have, unless you all have any questions. I will turn it over to Jim Angston, who's gonna wrap up with the PWNR again. Thank you, Carrie. So in wrapping up the uh, rest of the presentation, we wanna go over some public works and natural resources uh, projects. Next slide. Uh, we've broken them out uh, into basically five main categories, uh, starting with drainage, um, parks and open space and trails, or sewer wastewater, transportation, and water projects. Uh, we bring in, bring into the table about $63 million worth of capital improvement projects for next year. Next slide, please. Uh, first item real quick is just to, to go over a, a kind of the drainage project summary. Um, this this fund in our storm drainage fund is a little bit challenged. Uh, we're really only programming in a small capital contribution uh, for one project, which is the um, Resilient St. Verain project. Uh, we did provide a rather detailed update about a month ago for council, so I really didn't want to go into this project too much. Um, we will be bringing back uh, an update later this month um, or, or into the fall, I should say, excuse me, um, regarding the storm drainage fund um, and uh, providing a detailed update on the financial condition of the fund as well as the operational challenges we're currently facing. Next slide, please. So shifting over to our, our parks, open space and trail projects, uh, we have about $4 million programmed with not over nine projects. I'm gonna go over two key projects we're, we're looking at. Um, first, I wanna just provide a quick plug to, uh, to the uh, Parks and uh, Natural Resources Group. Uh, we were advised today uh, by the American Public Works Association, the Colorado chapter, that we were awarded uh, a chapter award for the Dickens Park um, in the category of parks and trails. So quick shout out to our uh, natural resources group. Uh, next slide. So one of the projects that we'll be working on, actually currently working on with some design this year into construction next year uh, is a, uh, the uh, next section of the St. Vrain Greenway. Uh, this is the east side of the city uh, heading out. It includes an underpass at uh, State Highway 119. Um, the, uh, the real kicker on this project is we did get some grant funding to the tune of about $1.5 million. So uh, a good effort by, again, our uh, natural resources group. Next slide, please. Falling under our asset management uh, component in parks and natural resources is the park infrastructure rehabilitation replacement. We're focusing on Lou Miller Park next year, uh, having a number of improvements. Uh, and uh, it is a renewal versus a complete rebuild. Uh, it is more, we found it's more cost effective to undertake renewal projects and rehabilitation projects versus complete rebuilds. Um, I think uh, we all can agree that um, one of the greatest assets we had during the uh, COVID emergency was 
our parks. Uh, a lot of use out of, of, out of people. We saw some challenges, but uh, people were really using them. Next slide, please. Shifting over to sewer, um, about four and a half million under six projects. Uh, the key project I want to focus on tonight is our wastewater treatment plant, Reg 85 improvements. Next slide, please. So over at the sewer plant, uh, one of the challenges um, and, and across the board for a, a lot of our uh, areas that are regulated by the state is when they impose new state regulations. Uh, in this case, uh, a few years ago, uh, they issued requirements to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in our uh, effluent discharges. Uh, so we initiated a compliance schedule. Um, we are currently on track with that schedule to uh, undertake design next year with construction to follow. Um, we are undertaking an alternative analysis to find what is the best way, whether it's a chemical uh, treatment or biological. Um, we've actually come up with a combination of both of those. Um, that we'll be instituting, uh, but uh, part of one of our biggest investments the city has is our wastewater treatment plant. So we wanna stay on the good side of the state um, and keep our permits. Um, next slide, please. So on our transportation, uh, we have some key projects that overlap into other areas. Um, the, uh, we're bringing about $16 million in next year uh, over six projects. Um, can you run the uh, next slide, please? First one is our major uh, asset management um, program, uh, the street rehab program. Uh, covers the entire city. Um, we uh, have a, a pretty strong program for knowing when, when and uh, which roads we need to upgrade. Um, the rehab includes, could include asphalt overlays, crack seal, chip seal, some forms of preservation. Uh, in some roads, we do have to can do a complete roadway reconstruction. Um, you see that over on Ninth Avenue, uh, west of Hover currently, where we were widening the road out slightly for bike lanes, but we did have to reconstruct it. Uh, there's too many failures on it. Um, in conjunction with our street rehab, we also undertake concrete repair and replacements, um, part of our ADA transition plan uh, to keep us in uh, um, current with, with uh, newer standards. Next slide, please. And I'm getting my pictures in. So you can see the bad paving that we replace. Um, TRP 11, our transportation system management um, CIP uh, covers a multitude of areas, our safety, multimodal and, and some minor capacity. We usually see it at intersection improvements, uh, includes school safety improvements, um, we also bring our uh, new signals out of this, uh, this project, um, neighborhood traffic mitigation. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, this traffic signal improvements at various intersections. Um, we were able to obtain a grant from CDOT, Colorado Department of Transportation, an HSIP grant. Um, that is Highway Safety and Improvement Program grant um, that brought about $800,000 into the fund um, with only a 10% match. So the city only had to come up with about 89,000 um, for a uh, $900,000 project. Next slide, please. Uh, Boston Avenue Connection. Uh, this is uh, tied in with our uh, quiet zone project as we're trying to get a, a crossing over uh, BNSF railroad tracks. Uh, this will also be one of the main routes for our, our BRT, 119 BRT connection. Um, we are currently working on conceptual design and property acquisition, uh, running into final design in 2021. Um, next slide, please. That brings us to railroad quiet zones. Um, we have been working on design as per direction uh, from city council. Uh, we were anticipating going to construction by the end of this year. Uh, that has gotten pushed into next year. Uh, in major part because we did receive an FRA grant, um, which covers half the cost of the $8 million project. Uh, that grant agreement is currently being finalized. Uh, part of that agreement included um, undertaking some environmental uh, work along the crossings to verify that there were no issues. Um, we will be bringing that grant agreement forward to council uh, in October. 
um, but we are currently still working on finalizing design, um, coordinating with BNSF and the PUC uh, on the project. Next slide. So one of the projects that's tied pretty closely with uh, our Resilient St. Verain project is the Boston Avenue Bridge over St. Verain, TRP 118. Uh, we have been working on design with construction in 2021. Uh, this widens out the, the, extends the bridge out to carry the 100 year uh, flows. Um, so it will improve flood protection in the area, um, provide bike and pet improvements uh, on the bridge. Um, this is the financial match for the Army Corps of Engineers project, which is just upstream of this. So it is critical that we uh, undertake this project so that we can get the next phase um, of the uh, RSVP underway. Next slide, please. So in closing out, um, we wanna go over some of the water projects, uh, which is uh, probably the biggest um, investment we have, $37 million next year, uh, kind of over 10 projects. Um, I wanna cover three key projects. Um, so within our water uh, supply system or water system, there are three main components, uh, supply, uh, treatment and distribution. Uh, and each of these projects covers one of those uh, elements. Next slide, please. So underwater supply, uh, we are gonna be working on the, um, our supply pipelines uh, up around Lyons. Um, we are proposing uh, to construct a uh, pump station uh, that connects our North St. Rain pipeline and our South St. Rain pipeline uh, to provide additional redundancy and efficiencies. Uh, critical item in this is that this is the, the last of the FEMA money we received uh, for some of our water projects. Um, so we wanna use those dollars up before they expire at the end of next year. Uh, the other project that uh, we'll be working on, continuing to work on is the South St. Verine pipeline rehab. Uh, it was damaged during the flood. Uh, we've repaired parts of it and now we're um, moving forward with the final areas to install some vaults, clean out the pipe um, and line some of the pipe uh, due to some of the damage that it received. Next slide. So uh, Price Park tank replacement, um, original um, open water storage reservoirs uh, in the black and white photo on the right. You can see uh, kind of in the lower left corner of that photo uh, shows the reservoirs. We are calling for replacement of the existing $7 million or 7 million <laughs> gallon tank and, and pump station. Uh, we are currently working on design. Uh, construction is slated for next year. And it's important to note that uh, this is one of the uh, the funding for this project is supported via the bond election that is coming up this November. Next slide, please. And in closing out, I um, wanted to real quick give you an overview of the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant expansion. Uh, that is also um, funding proposed through the bond election. Uh, design, we're doing a design build on it. It's currently design is underway. Um, this will replace uh, this expansion will replace the capacity uh, from the Wade Gaddis plant that we've had some challenges with meeting uh, requirements and regulations on, uh, providing additional redundancy and resilience for, for the system. Uh, rather large project construction is slated for uh, late next year through 2023. And with that, I'll slide into the last slide and open it up for any questions. All right, uh, Dr. Let's go with actually Councilor Christian. If you'd raise your hand earlier, I apologize. Uh, the screen's popping up the people who are spot, uh, speaking. So um, Dr. Waters was talking a lot, so I apologize. Go ahead. Sorry, Tim. That's okay. I don't remember what it was about anyway at this point. Um, so um, Jim, when you first showed the picture of the Boston Bridge, there was a little illustration of a little girl crossing the street. The, Boston Avenue bridge with a rubber red um, bridge that rolled out and then rolled back and then just and you could slap it back out. I thought that was kind of an interesting idea. Um, that's obviously not what you're doing. Um, I did want to ask you if this um, 
I'm part of the Boulder County Consortium and the city, the county is going to fund a um, bicycle lane all the way from I-25 into Longmont. I'm wondering if that's part of this, any of these projects or if you know about that. <laughs> it's it's I, a really wonderful idea because once we, it'll help our connectivity. People can take their buses, their bikes, uh, various places and then bike from I-25 back into town. I think that's, that's it is not actually included in, in any of these projects. Uh, I think that's early in the planning stages. Okay. Um, right. But we will certainly be be willing and, and partner with them for anything that's coming into town. Yeah, it'll be a nice connection with everything that you guys have planned. Thank you. Oh, sorry about muted. Go ahead, <laughs> Tim, go ahead. Thanks, I know I'm using way more money to share, more of my share, more of my airtime share than I deserve. But <clears throat> uh, Jim, just real quickly, the, the price of Park Tank and the Nelson Flanders, that's 30 million of the 80 million if we get approval in no November. Um, I believe those are the numbers. Um, yeah, that's a rough approximation of those two projects. I just yeah, they're they're clarify. We've got there is some of, of other, some other of those, projects. Yeah, there is some that that is part of the. There is some funding available already that we're utilizing out of existing um, funds. But I would probably want to defer to to Becky Doyle uh, on that. Uh, I think she was still on the call. So um. yes, hi. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Just, just to just to clarify that the the thirty million dollars for the park price tank and the Nelson Flanders that's thirty million of what what we would hope to be able to uh, to you to spend an eighty million dollar in the from an eighty million dollar water bond. There, there are some, oh got a little feedback there, <laughs> Mayor and Council. Uh, there are some components of both of those projects that are that are funded out of the fund balance in the water fund. So. Um, the components that uh, would be funded as part of the bond um, are, are currently shown as unfunded and uh, so don't come into the totals that are in those projects there. So, so there, there's both existing fund balance and uh, you know future debt that's a part of both of those projects. All right. Becky, how does, it, how does the debt break out for those projects? Uh, we'd have to look at the unfunded components, but we're looking at probably something near uh, for 35 million toward the plant and about 15 toward uh, the price park tank. So these are just the first installments of, of, of that $80 million with what we're seeing in the next year's PI, CIP budget. N not exactly. What you're seeing in next year's CIP budget are components that are not real that are that are funded outside of that 80 million dollars so that's oh, this is in addition to yes yeah, yeah. part of the project right. we could get started next year and would finish it with the 80 million got it okay that's helpful number one number two uh jim the 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 um the, the two million dollars for quiet zones that are budgeted for 2021 with what we budgeted this year does that get us to the four million dollar match we need to be able to to spend the federal grant I think I have that also. Uh, so we're we're splitting out the both the grant funding and the match funding over the next two years. So um, I believe it's sort of a four and four plan, but we're, we've incorporated both the revenue from the grant and then also uh, fund balance as our contribution. But, so, but, but Mayor, doing two million next year gets us to the four million match. We got don't we have to match the four million dollar federal grant? I think what we programmed in is Mayor Bagley, um, Councilman Waters. We program we have a, a, a million this year. We programmed two million um, in 2021. I believe we have uh, another million programmed in the future. So um, we, we spread it out over several years. There is a million this year, two million next year. I think a million beyond that to get us to the. But that gets us going. We, we we've done enough. Yes. To start. All right. That, Two, relate, two, uh, two unrelated 
to the CIP budget as it exists right now. <clears throat> One, uh, uh, if we have if we have intersections that meet warrants for traffic signals, uh, and we have and we don't see anything in this budget that sets money aside for traffic for intersections that meet warrants. Um, is it is it fair to say that regardless of what this budget looks like, we would install traffic signals if intersections meet one of the nine warrants for a traffic signal? And I'm thinking specifically about County Line Road One and 17th Avenue, as we as we as we as I learned today from Dale. Indeed, we are in the process of of widening County Line Road One. Uh, which was on and then off and, you know, is obviously back in under underway right now. Um, if that intersection meets warrants in 2021, will, will we be able, will we be budgeted to install a traffic signal in 2021? Uh, Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Waters, let me try to answer that one. Um, so the first criteria is that they, they have to meet warrants. The second is, is that we have to have funding available to do it. And so I, I don't know that we're in a position right now to say that we're going to be able to fund additional intersections in 2021 that haven't been identified yet. Um, the street fund is pretty heavily hit by, by both uh, the pandemic as well as some of the projects that we're trying to fund out of there. So it takes both. It, it has to meet the criteria and then we have to uh, I call it scrape up the dollars. And we either get that, by the way, through grants, um, or we find uh, enough dollars out of the street and sales tax uh, fund to do that. So I think the answer was no. The answer is not necessarily. The, the answer is not, it's not a given. If, if it meets a warrant, it's not an absolute given that it will be built in any given year. It depends on funding also being available. You know, you do. I have asked this question before, and I've gotten a different answer. You know that. I, uh, I hope not for me, but maybe. Well, I, th I thought it was my understanding that once they met a warrant, whether we had budgeted for it or not, we were going to we would install traffic signals if we had intersections that met warrants. And and since I didn't see anything in here. I, I don't know whether that intersection will meet warrants, but I, uh, I'm, I'm concerned if we have intersections that do and, and we say to residents, well, it meets warrants, but simply we can't afford to give you traffic light. Maybe the thing to do, um, yeah, Council Member Waters, I can have the engineering group look to see, uh, are there any intersections that are meeting warrants or anticipated to meet warrants in 21 that we have not identified funding to do the uh, signal light? Is that yep. fair? Yeah, that'd be fair. Thanks. Appreciate that. I'm done. All right. Great. Wait, wait. You sure, Tim? I'm going to hold you to it. You said, I'm done. I'm gonna... <laughs> All right. Just giving you, just giving you crap. It's only 1030. We're good. All right. Anything else from you guys, Harold? Yeah. Um, just to summarize, I just wanted to um, point out, since we'll be going through this for the next few weeks, uh, if council has any questions along the way that they want to send us in between the meetings, we'll follow up on them and work them into the council communication, work the answer Zoom. Uh, and I will try to work in the answer, a better answer, Tim, to your question about the uh, bond projects. Uh, I know I can get it straight if I get it down in writing. Um, and I'm also going to include a revised schedule for the council for the next few meetings as well, because We've already changed it quite a bit from what the original was with the budget message. We have um, time available to us in, in future meetings here this month and early next month. And we don't wanna overload any of the um, meetings with other, uh, that have other council business on them with budget items. So we're gonna be a little flexible and move things as, as, uh, as we can to try to not overload the meetings. Uh, with that, I, I just want to apologize. I thought Mr. Angstant was going to send you all some goodies to your house and the doorbell was going to ring and you were going to get some cookies or something, but apparently he didn't come through. So I wouldn't stay up late waiting for it. That's all I, I want, got. I want, wait, so I don't understand. So there, there might be cookies or there could might stay, not be. Could stay up and wait. I don't know. <laughs> 
All right, I'm not gonna say that. All right, let's move on to council council comments. Anybody? That's awesome. Good. Harold, anything? No comments, Mayor. All right. Eugene, how about you? He's I can hear snoring. No snoring here yet, Mayor. Good, good morning, Eugene. Nice, nice you could join us. Nice Pretty you could close. <laughs> All right, then uh, let's go ahead and have a motion if we could. Joan, you wanna make a motion? Sure, I move to adjourn. I'll second that. Second. All right, all, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, have a good night, guys. See you later. And Harold, I'll come in and sign stuff tomorrow. Have Michelle drop it off or- Harold, go is it your birthday? It, it is actually. Oh. told me, happy birthday. <laughs> Happy, yeah, happy birthday, Harold. Yeah, uh, you're lucky we adjourned or I'd sing to you, but that's not going to happen. Not on weather. Yeah. All yeah. right. We Later, guys. Happy birthday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.